All right, fam. Silk here, yet again, if you don't know what's going on. I'm filling in for Chris during these intros for the next few episodes. He's off on paternity leave. Got a new baby boy. We're so excited for Chris, and uh, that means I'm doing these intros. So you better get used to it, guys. Today, I want to thank our Patreon members. I see all your names when you sign up. I see all your names when I make the outros of the episode. I appreciate all of you. We all do. You keep the wheels greased on this thing. So thank you. And if you want to sign up, it's a great way to show your support for the show. You can head over to thebombhole.com. And while you're there, just check out the site. Just check it out. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. It's got all our videos, all our episodes. And it's also got all the latest snowboarding videos. Not ours. Just cool stuff. If you like snowboarding, you're going to like the website, thebombhole.com. Bookmark it if you want. Whatever. I also want to thank all the sponsors for today's episode. We genuinely appreciate all of your support so much. We've got Bubs Naturals, Gosney, Autumn Headwear, Capita Snowboards, Union Binding Company, Herschel Yeti, Pub Beer, Mammoth, and Kodiak Cakes. Thank you so much. Now... Let's get into today's guest. We have Sean Miskaman in studio. Wow. Now, if you don't know who Sean is, he's a bit of a young gun. You know, he's coming for all the old heads out there. Backcountry, God. And uh, style through the roof, trick selection through the roof, spot selection, impeccable. If you watch him, you would have no idea that he is so young. He is a serious threat in the game. And he came on here and shared some incredible stories with us. He's been through some insane rescues. He's had some gnarly, gnarly injuries. Very serious stuff. He prioritizes safety out there. He's learning so quickly. And you're definitely going to want to keep your eyes on Sean. So without further ado, let's get into the Sean Miskiman episode. You are listening to the... Hey, MFM. See you on the list. Back attack, dude. <laughs> Hey, your homies good. Slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right. Welcome back to the bomb hole, which is presented by Run Through a Wall Smelling Salts. Today, we got some Canadians in the booth. We got Craig McMorris co-hosting. What's happening, Craig? Uh, pumped to be here. Stoked to ride. Love to hear that. We got Silk D rocking sunglasses in studio. What up? Freshly <laughs> married, too. Oh, yep. You? Yeah. A couple of days ago. By the time this comes out, it will have been a while ago, but... Yep. yep, and uh, just married on the back of Silk's uh, vehicle right now. If you guys are wondering, it says it in uh, paint yep. marker. If you've so. seen it around, so like, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got Sean Miskimen. What's happening? Happy to have you in studio. We're just cruising. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me in the booth. Nice to be here. Thanks, Silk, Craig, Grenier. Let's do this. Let's get right into it. Uh, how was the travels this morning? Travels were good, you know. We woke. I woke up at uh, four twenty in the morning. Ooh, ooh. I was gonna set an alarm nice. for four thirty, but uh, figured I'd hit the four twenty. And you know, time traveled on my way here. And next thing you know, we're in the booth. Customs? Any problems? No, no. They let me on. Spick and span. Love Didn't that. tell them I was coming to do a podcast. That's for damn Perfect. sure. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, Craig, maybe you could go ahead and take this. Uh, I'm going to throw it to you. You're a professional. It was 4.20 a.m., just so everybody knows that. Not 4.20 p.m. We woke up at 4.20 a.m., an ungodly hour, and I don't think I'm a human till right now. <laughs> I also, cannot stand that. Craig, so. not a morning guy. Craig isn't a morning guy. I don't mind mornings. In the wintertime, I'm pretty good, but summertime, I definitely sleep in a lot. Get this snooze. Now, you guys are from the same region, Craig. Maybe you could tee up a question. White City, Saskatchewan. Tell me about it, Sean. Yep, so I am from White City, Saskatchewan, the place where you can watch your dog run away for two days. Woo. Nah, there's uh, not many mountains there, but I was uh, very lucky to have some amazing people that I looked up to growing up. And uh, yeah, so basically I got into snowboarding. I found out one day about snowboarding by my dad bringing home a newspaper article of Mark, your brother, snowboarding. And I did the classic Saskatchewan Canadian kid playing hockey and when I remember when I read that newspaper, I instantly changed my mind. I was like, I'm going to fucking snowboard forever and quit hockey that day. And my dad bought me a snowboard. And next thing you know, what kind of snowboard? It was a Firefly Sport Check Custom, you know, the classic. 
Absolutely Christmas complete. What are we talking? Backyard setup? Are you going to Mission Ridge? That's a little resort. Shout out Mission Ridge um, in Saskatchewan. Um, pretty close to White City, no? Yeah. It's, so there was a small little hill. Not When I mean small, small little hill. And I was pretty lucky I would be able to go there on the weekends. But I was also very lucky that I have two very supportive parents. And my dad had built me a two-story drop-in ramp and Ooh. welded me this yellow rail. And I would spend hours out there. When I mean hours, I would like get home from school at three o'clock and I would be out there until eight and nine and my parents would have to drag me in. My mom would be out there with the little video camera and that was my little safe haven. Loyal loyal to the steel. I got a question about this. You have a two-story drop-in ramp to a yellow flat bar? Yeah, yeah, but it was like... (laughs) Like if you would see, Why are you going to yeah, what, let's talk physics. No, it's here. flat though. It's flat. There's it, no it's, flat. It, you don't need to go two stories with the speed though. You need speed, but you the need speed that's actually a good. How this, long is it? No, it's a good. This is a good thing because the you can't like stick snow on the the drop in ramp, so it was carpet, so you wouldn't actually go that I fast. See. It didn't start that high. I it was see. a double decker. There was a smaller one and a bigger one, okay. and then we also like I had like a tiny little jump. There's a funny YouTube video of me. Doing 360s off this little jump to flow rider right round. Ooh. I watched that video actually in preparation for this, and, yeah. and it was it was electric. Flow rider, uh, great great track for that. Now I'm curious, you know, you kind of breezed over that you played hockey. I'm curious, uh, what position were you surgical with the lumber? Were you going top cheddar bar down? Walk us through it. Oh, I was pretty young, but I I played center. I was kind oh, of so taking faceoffs. Yeah. I was taking faceoffs. I was kind of the instigator. Like I would kind of go out there and kind of like ruffle up, not ruffle up cuz I was a, like I'm a pretty small guy. But I was kind of a, of a Brad Marsh is what you could I say. I was kind of out there to like make some penalties happen and kind of try make some plays, but I was kind of out there just fucking around. Mm. Okay. Now let's go back to the rail. So we're talking your dad <laughs> your dad blasted this thing up. He's a welder. Uh, yeah, well, my dad, both my parents are actually, my dad works for a school division and my mom's a teacher, but uh, my dad was able to like weld me this like yellow rail with a little wally on the front because at first I didn't know how to pop on from the sides and that was like, dude, it was the beginning of it all. There's a bunch of zeeches that went down on that thing for sure. Love that. So then you're, you're learning to ride uh, going down a ramp into a piece of steel, which is uh very respectable, uh, and <laughs> still a lot of us do that into our adulthood. Um, but going back to learn how to ride the hill, what did that look like? That was um, it was different. Like there, when a, it's a very small hill, and there was a small park. But I was really lucky at a young age. I was able to link up with Russell Davies, who is a snowboard coach out in Saskatchewan. He coached. Yeah, give that guy an air horn. I owe him so much. And um, he was able to kind of like start to teach me some things as well as I had a couple older guys from Extreme Adrenaline Board Shop and they were amazing. They would pick me up some days after school and uh, shout out Matt Carey. That guy deserves an air horn. D. Rucker, all those guys. And we would just go board with, I'd go board with them. They were about 22 years old and I was like 10 years old, but they were like my big brothers at the time. And Russell Davies, one of the only people whose name is Russell and also lives in a town called Russell, which is very confusing (laughs) for um, audience members, but he would make you not just go to the park, right? You would be, you know, going to sunshine and and racing for pink slips, right? Oh, yeah. You know the deal. So when, while living in Saskatchewan, as I slowly started to snowboard more, Russell would, on the weekends, drive me from Regina to Banff. And we would spend weekends in Banff and we wouldn't ride the park. It was, we were there to ride the mountain. We were there to ride powder. And he always had this funny line that he would say he would race me switch for my snowboard. And it was like always a joke. He's like, I'll race you switch for your snowboard. He was obviously going to kick my ass, but <laughs> I'm Dan Russell. <laughs> I have a question. Was he also part of your formative years? He I, was. I remember you talking about him. Yeah, yeah he was the one who started a Saskatchewan snowboard team. So, right, you would get in the van, and and um, for the folks that aren't very familiar with Canadian geography, Regina to Banff, that's like a nine-hour van trip, right? Oh, yeah. It's like a mission out there. And I remember there were some days it would be like we wouldn't be getting into Banff until late, like midnight, one o'clock, and he would be sleeping and I would just be fucking in the whip, just chilling. And he was like so, he's so committed to Saskatchewan snowboarders and which is so amazing because Saskatchewan, there's not much of a scene or a culture and he's committed to like giving kids their opportunity to snowboard and really like sharing his passion for it, which is amazing. I love it. So where do we go from here? So you're you're in Saskatchewan, you're going to Banff on the weekends. 
probably busting some back threes, front threes. Oh, if I was lucky at that point, I was just like kind of starting to get like the grips of snowboarding, which was amazing. And then when I was 14 years old, um, we, I actually had the opportunity to go to a sports school in Calgary, Alberta, right at the base of the mountain there called COP and linked up with a snowboard crew there. And that was kind of like where I slowly started to get into riding more park. It was like the dream setup. I went to school from my science class. I could look out at the park, at the pipe, and I didn't spend much time at school, to be honest with you. I was bailing to the mountain every day. That's that sports school. Any any famous alums come out of there? Yep. We got Jed Anderson, and we got uh, probably the most famous one. We got Russell Chai. Wow. Ooh, Very can't. prestigious. Russell 69, yeah. for those who are unfamiliar. <laughs> he could yes. be the principal there, probably. Yeah. Russell, Russell uh, before he got behind the camera, though, was really putting a beat down out there, right? Oh, I actually have a great Russell Chai story. One of my, like, I did a few rail contests, but my first rail contest at COP, Russell Chai coached me at the top because I had no one at the top. Did you get last? <laughs> <laughs> was he wearing Air Monarchs? I, I have no idea. I just have a very distinct memory of Russell Chai telling me how to do a 180 onto this flat down square box rail thing. And I like always, I never like remember it, but every now and then I'm like hanging out with Russ and he's talking shit. And I'm like, I remember this like it was the other day. Like, <laughs> would have been like 14 years old, 15 years old at this time. And Russell Chai was my coach and now he's one of my like close friends. It's a pretty funny full circle moment. Okay. So you spent two years in Calgary, right? Yep. Early and you're doing contests and figuring shit out. Yep. So I spent two years in Calgary. I was kind of doing contests, some of the local contests there. And then when I was 16 years old, I got on the junior Canadian slope style team, whatever you want to call it. And I moved to Whistler and moved in with Mikey Cicerelli. We had legend right there. Now, like, basically family. And our neighbor was Darcy Sharp. So I kind of got, like, thrown into the best crew of people ever. Now, uh, I'm curious. Peak Sean Miskiman, you're at a slope style run. You put down your perfect run, peak comp mode. Just, you know, you don't need to be humble. Just tell us, like, tell us what you could bang us over the head with. Oh, honestly, I was not. I'm fucking good thing I got in back country because I wasn't the best slope style, but I was probably doing like a cap nine, back ten. If I was lucky, a front ten, that, nine. That ten, ain't bad. Nine. Those are great tricks. Those, I don't know why you're like that. Silk, what do you think about that run? Um, I can't do that. It's a fantastic. <laughs> I can't do that run. I know, but compared to nowadays, those kids are spinning like tops. This wasn't nowadays. Yeah, that yeah. was back then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, six months ago for you. Well, thanks, boys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Darcy Sharp is your neighbor. That's got to be a wild way to kind of get introduced to the world. Craig, if I could just go ahead and interrupt you. We have a guest question from Darcy Sharp. Here we go. Yo, Sean, it's Darcy. I was wondering if you want to tell some stories about what it was like being neighbors with us, maybe like the time we <laughs> carried your bed down the stairs at 2 a.m., <laughs> pretty much dropping you half asleep in the stairway. Hope you're well, buddy. <laughs> Dars, you're the man. I love you, brother. Well, actually, to begin with, I was originally supposed to move in with Darcy Sharp, and Mikey told me to not move in with him because I was going to become a burnout. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the shotgun? Shotgun, shotgun. Yes, we do. Hold, hold tight. <laughs> okay, we're there. Wow. Sorry, Dars, I'm calling you out. But uh, so that's how I linked up living with Mikey. I had the opportunity. Mikey was like, you don't want to live with Darcy. Um, I he's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going to the story of them carrying my bed down the stairs while I was half asleep. It was my 18th birthday. And uh, I snuck into a couple of the bars in Whistler using. Mikey. Allegedly. Allegedly. A- allegedly. Allegedly using Mikey's ID. And I got home and, you know, I was, fe- I was feeling it. I was having fun. And then, uh, yeah, I woke up to Darcy and his roommate Marcos carrying my bed down the fucking stairs. And I was 18, just wanting to sleep. And then they just bailed and left my bed in the middle of the stairs and ran out the house. And that was like, that was just the beginning of it. Like being living with Darcy, we caused some ruckus in that building. At one moment, we had a 50cc dirt bike in the kitchen doing burnouts. And we were living, we were living young and having fun. Running it a bit hot, you could say. Running it hot. But you got to do it while you're young. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing when you're 18, living in Whistler. That's literally par for the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's good to get it out of you when you're young, and then when you're older, you're like locked in. You got all those life experiences. Let's just derail because it does seem like you guys did just turn up to 11 for Rasmund's uh, wedding this weekend. Yep. Can you give us a couple highlights? (laughs) Give us a couple highlights. Craig, you were there as well, right? I was there. I was there, yes. Um, Congrats to Chris and Lucy. I'm so happy for them, first of all. Chris has been like a big brother to me throughout the years, and uh, yeah, it was a beautiful wedding, but I think uh, one of my favorite highlights was watching Travis Rice dance to Sexy Red. It was fucking hilarious. Yeah, don't go slow. Yeah, that was... <laughs> um, what else? Mike went psycho. Yep. Psycho Mike made an appearance. There was so It was just so fun. We danced. Jody was fully weaponized. Oh, yeah, and when Jody gets weaponized, it's a fucking go. Yeah, it's a quick 20. He's just comedy. Yeah, he is hilarious. Kid was in the pocket. Yeah, yeah in the pocket. Big time. Okay, let's get back to the uh, the arc of Sean Miskiman's snowboard career. The rise, we'll call it. So you're in Calgs, you moved to Whistler. Uh, where are we at here? Comp mode, still pounded away slope style jumps. Yeah, so I've when I moved to Whistler when I was 16, I spent two years with the Canadian program. I was uh, still kind of riding with them, doing slope style stuff. And then eventually when I was 18, I got the boot. Um, and... Yeah, at that point, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, snowboarding in the back, like trying to decide if I wanted to like snowboard in the backcountry. But I was like really committed because I was like so inspired by Mark growing up. I like really wanted to do this, the contest route and be able to do that. And then when I was 18 turning 19, I broke my leg pretty badly at this point. And at that point, I didn't, I was like so, I was like a lost little lost guy. I was like, shit, like my leg is so broken. I had to get surgery and do all that fun stuff. And then I was like, all I could think about was going to the mountain and riding powder with my friends. I wasn't missing all that contest stuff. And then I I was talking to Tyler Nicholson and he was like, you know what, if that's what you want to do, buy a sled, dude. Like it's good to get in young. You need to learn how to operate a machine. Like just do it. And it was, it's funny because I look back on that time and I was so bummed, but it like, fully changed my life path and it's just like it speaks to the the point that everything happens for a reason and you and tyler were both broke off at a, a similar point correct yeah so there's a funny story behind that so tyler had blew his knee at that point and um uh tyler had blew his knee at that point and no one would drive him to his surgery in banff and so I drove him to his knee surgery in Banff. And when we were leaving the hospital, we looked insane. I was in crutches and a cast trying to wheelchair Tyler out after knee surgery. And the, <laughs> the doctors were looking at us and they were like, what is going on with you two? Just two young snowboard kids, long hair, loose. It was, it was pretty funny. I mean, the one thing that's amazing about that is just two war dogs that have been leaving it all on the battlefield. We're talking broken leg, blown out knee, hobbling through the hospital, laying it all on the line. You love to see it. Yeah, and it's like, that's kind of like what, like how I first got like introduced to Tyler and like got closer to him. Like, I think we spent the neck, we spent our whole rehab together in the gym, working out, like being by our side. And like, I spent a month on his couch, living on his couch and we would just play video games all day and talk. And he was like a huge motivator and like to like push me in the direction of like hey dude like be you like you want to do this like buy a sled like you got this I remember going into his garage the one day and he was like showing me the snowmobile his sled and I was like this is the coolest thing And he's like dude you can do this like all you do is got to work for it and like once you do this you'll be so happy and you'll never want to look back Speaking of Tyler, he brought up something when I was talking to him yesterday where he was saying that at one point you had a pretty big, like, dickhead coach. It was essentially saying, like, hey, man, I don't know if you have the big tricks. Like, maybe you should think about quitting snowboarding. Is that true or false? Uh, it's There's moments of trueness in there. I definitely had some coaches who were like, hey, like, we don't know if you got the tricks and such and stuff. And, like, I think they knew that I wanted to go into that route. And, like, they were just trying to push me and be like, hey, man, like, it's okay to be you. Like, you don't need to follow this path just because someone you looked up to did it. Like, be you. Because I was always, like, it was funny. Well, during the training camps, I was always fucking off and trying to ride pal. Like, that was, like, when I was the happiest on my snowboard. So I think they saw that and started to, like, push me in that direction. Was it scary a little bit when your whole, like, snowboarding, you're very young right now, and and the best part about 
doing contests is you know where you're going all winter and like this is the hotel that you're staying in and this is when you show up and you ride at this place like when you stop doing that you have to structure your own season and it's kind of overwhelming like there's so much coming at you was that kind of tough for you or you knew that you wanted to go that way i just wanted to snowboard and ride pal with my friends like i didn't really like whether it was structured or not i like the first year I fully took a year off of snowboarding to just learn how to ride my snowmobile because I was like, if I do get the opportunity to film in the backcountry for like a snowboard movie, it's so important to be dialed out there and have that experience and not be the slow one because it's like some of those big days, if like you're already full of adrenaline from trying to sled to the spot, how are you supposed to snowboard? And also one thing I thought think is interesting, you're wise beyond your years to take an avalanche course before any of this, right? Yeah. So when I first bought my sled, the first thing I did was I was very lucky that I got to go to Pat Moore's risk maturity course at Baldface. And it's the one thing I do have to say is it's the most important thing you could do. Not only just do an AST one course, like make sure you do your refreshers, make sure you're constantly working on your craft because it's not, you're not responsible. It's not for you. It's for your friends. And like your friends are trusting you and you owe that to the crew to be as dialed and dialed as you can. And you didn't take your snowboard with you a lot in that first year of sledding, no? No, I barely brought my snowboard with me. I was just out there to, like, gain experience, like, gain that kind of, like, mountain experience because it's different. Like, you need to learn how to travel and, like, just be comfortable in that terrain, learn how to read terrain, so learn, like, really, like, spend time out there because, like, when you first go out, even if you're the best sledder ever, you're going to be, like, scared, and that, that takes away from your energy at the end of the day. And you're wise, too, because when you're going out and building the jump, when it's a powder day, it's hard to get the machines to the jump. And if you're with a rookie, you're not getting the call if they're going to be a liability and you can't go hit a cheese wedge or whatever. Yeah, that was like a big thing, Aaron. When I first bought a sled, Aaron like kind of drilled that into me. He's like, dude, if you want to do this, like you need to learn how to like run your machine. And he was actually amazing. There was days in between when he was filming. I think it was Powder Hounds Volume 2 that year he would take me off out on down days and teach me how to sled. Aaron Leyland. Yeah. Yeah. What a legend. Give that guy an air horn. Yep. But that's like kind of my biggest piece of advice for anyone who wants to get in the backcountry somewhere is like get out there, learn how to be in the mountains, learn how to operate a machine. It will help you out tenfold. And the avalanche uh, awareness courses or whatever risk maturity or whatever local avalanche course you can take, they just scared the shit out of you. So you actually realize, because I think a lot of people in the early years got lucky just through ignorance. Like they just somehow in the early days didn't get in bad situations, but now we know enough to, to do that. And you had to use that, that knowledge very, very early in your snowboard career, no? Yeah. So unfortunately we were involved in a avalanche. This was my second year with the snowmobile. I had the opportunity to start filming that winter for a project and me and Mikey Cicerelli and our friend Sam decided to go out on a late December day. And unfortunately there was another crew there that had set off an avalanche and basically the way it happened was we were on the side of the ridge in a nice protected pocket and I was about to drop in for this little jump we had built. We were just like kind of, you know, getting our feet wet, trying to test the waters. Me and Mikey hadn't really ever filmed or done anything. And uh, I remember standing at the top of the drop-in and all of a sudden hearing Mikey yell, avalanche, avalanche. And I looked to my right and just in the distance, I could see these like car-sized tr- chunks of like snow falling through. And it was, it was like the most hectic, craziest moment of my life. Why We all ended up running, like ripping down to our sleds, getting on them with all our gear, of course, and going to the slide and we had to perform a rescue and it was it was pre- it was one of the most eye opening experiences of my life. Like walk, walk us through like specifically everything that happened in this rescue, like from switching your beacon to search mode to just like painting a full picture of the scene. Yeah. So after we saw the avalanche, instantly we all knew we had known that there was a crew that was going up to that face. It was actually a face that we had talked about riding in the morning, but decided to pull back from it because we didn't think it was a safe option with the knowledge that we saw. But this crew had gone up there, so we knew that it was probably an avalanche incident, and we could hear yelling. Um, We had ripped over on our sleds. We were only, like, 
a 30 second sled away from the bottom of the face with your backpack and everything. Okay. Yeah. With our backpack, it's like one of the most important things is staying organized. Like you don't want your shovel here, your probe here. Cause you don't like for us, like we knew we were in a safe zone, but like, you don't know what's going to happen if there's another crew or like someone, something, anything could happen out there. But anyways, we rolled to the bottom of the avalanche debris and it was massive. It was like size three, huge, full face, rip to rip. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. And when we got to the bottom, there was, it was a crew of four. Two of them were at the bottom. One was at the top and we were able to talk to them. They were able, time started to move so slow, but it felt so hectic in the moment. And they were able to let us know that there was one buried and the person up top, everyone was in search and they, the guy up top was scanning on the way down just in case he got hung up on the trees. And we all flipped our beacons into search mode and started searching while we were searching, there was a little bit of confusion with the beacons. It was like, that was one of the biggest things. Everyone was so like hyped up on adrenaline that one of the beacons was reading 50 or five meters, but they thought it was 50 because it was 5.0. And there was a little bit of confusion. But then in the end, Mikey ended up getting on a single and started calling out the numbers. So I put my beacon away and pulled out my probe and just followed him because I was like, I'm not going to follow the same beacon path two feet behind him. And then Mikey was lucky enough to do the grid, nailed it, fucking nailed it. And I think I probe struck him first hit, and then we just went into dig mode. You guys were digging like crazy, I bet, right? Yeah, crazy. We were really lucky because it was pretty cold at this point, so the snow didn't really like freeze up, but he was buried two meters deep. And when we got to him, he was face down. And I remember, like, when we got to him, I was full tears, like, f freaking out. I did not know what we were going to see because he had to go through our cliff band and some trees. And it was, like, after being at the avalanche course, we know that, like, it's not just getting him out. Like, he could have had trauma. And I was like, this is going to be intense. And me and Mikey were both in tears. And then, lucky enough, we got to his airways, pulled out a snow plug, which was blocking his airway. And he was blue in the face and he started coughing. And his smile will be something that like I'll remember for the rest of my life. He like started coughing. We got him on his back and he just opened his eyes and started smiling. And then put on these sunglasses and just got up and walked out of the hole. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. We couldn't even believe it. The search and rescue that came, there was two search and rescue helicopters that came. And they didn't even, they were like, are you sure this is the guy? And he was in full like shock in the moment and it was it was a moment that like most people go their whole careers with never having to deal with an incident like that and it was pretty crazy second year in pretty green having to deal with one of those situations you get in your truck in the parking lot after something like that how do you just drive home it was a rough drive home it was at that time me and mikey were living together but i remember i pulled into green Lake gas station because a lot of my friends Whistler's a small town, and they had knew there was an avalanche incident. So when I got back to service, my phone was blowing up, being like, what happened? Are you okay? All this stuff. And it kind of all hit me from, like, I wanted to ride that face in the morning, and we made the decision to not. And then I, I remember pulling over and just, like, breaking down into tears. I was like, do I want to keep doing this? Like, that could have been me, and it's not just on me. It's on my family at that point. It was a, it was a big eye-opener, but I realized that, if you have a good crew and you trust your crew and you do all the right things, like it's a risk that's worth taking in my mind. Damn. What do you think looking back on it were the ingredients that were the key to success for a, a rescue? Well, by no means was it a perfect rescue. Like it was, we calculated it from photos. It was about five minutes, but like some of my biggest takeaways were slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Like if we would have took that extra second to be like, take a deep breath, you're a leader, you're on all this stuff and like organize it a little bit better. It would have made things so much easier as well as like being able to trust, like be with a crew that's like you trust and has knowledge that knows how to work together. Like that was the biggest thing because we were coming in as a secondhand group. We didn't know each other. We didn't know how to communicate properly. So there was a little bit of disconnect in that sense too, as well as like trusting your gut. Like we just had a bad feeling about that face in the morning, which turned us away, but that crew didn't, they didn't have that feeling. And unfortunately 
it was that they had that incident. But I'm so happy that it ended the way it did. And yeah, I just, I still talk to the person who was in the incident all the time. And lucky enough, right after we were able to go meet his family and his kids. And it was a pretty special moment. We all had dinner there. It was really nice. Cool. Damn. That's really fucking cool. Wow. So now moving forward, are you extra, do you take extra precautions on who you choose to go to the mountains with, who your crew is? Yeah, totally. Like for me, it's like, not that I take extra precautions, but like, I'm definitely like, I make sure that I, we have our dialed crews and I make sure everyone's kind of on the same page because it, it's not like, it just takes one person to be like, little bit cowboy and then puts everyone in a situation or someone to not be as dialed and has an old beacon or doesn't know to turn it into search or all those little things. So it's just like when I, we go out in the mountains, like I know I'm, I always make sure and trust the fact that my crew's got my back and I, that I have my crew's back and we're just all on the same page and have the same language and lingo. Cause you don't do those avalanche courses for yourself. No, you don't. Not at all. It's like, at the end of the day, you're not doing transceiver practice practice for yourself. You're not doing those avalanche courses for yourself. You're doing it for your friends. And you like when you go into the mountains, I think you owe that to them. It's like they're doing that for you and you're doing that for them. And that like kind of creates that team energy when you're out in the mountains. Now you guys are are just a straight up dialed machine when you guys go in the mountains. Are you communicating with uh okay, I got first aid, you have rescue zip ties and or not zip, like you know uh volley straps or are you guys communicating with what you have in your pack i have a sat phone i have this i have that oh yeah so each one of our crew we all run the same beacon we all have first aid personal first aid kits we all know and then we have like one big crew first aid kit and we know exactly where it is in the bag and someone has a sat phone and everyone knows where it is. We know exactly what's in it. It's a cr- We actually pitch in together as a crew at the start of the year to have everything in one place. And it's like like our crew has like come to a very streamlined process. Like I know exactly where Rasmund's like beacon is, how to turn off. We run the same beacon. I know where the first aid kit is. I know where everything is. So does Rasmund. So does all the other boys. So it's I've, I feel very, very grateful. And I think by Lucky Stars every day that I have such an amazing crew. Boys are dialed in. Love to see it. Love to see it. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that story. That was fucking awesome. It's hard um, to talk about those sometimes. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because it's like things ended well, but like it's still like weird to talk about because yep. it's like goes back into that moment. I know that it could have very easily not done that. And like since that moment, like there's I have two beacons now. I'll throw a beacon in my backyard and do beacon practice. And yeah, it's interesting. Should have done that instead of trivia. Find that, find that beacon. <laughs> find that beacon or that bacon. We'll hide bacon or beacons here. I'm going to fill the dog. Bacon. Fill the dog involved. He'll fucking sniff that thing out. Mr. Man. We'll get Mr. Man involved. So, uh, all right, we're going back to filming here. Let's, or you're, you're starting to film. You haven't even started yet. You do an insane rescue. Uh, what did it look like dipping your toes into the filming world? All right, big news coming at you from the bomb hole. Capita has launched their whole new collection. All of new boards are available now. So check them out. Now, of course, you got staples like the DOA. Everyone loves that thing. Everyone loves the Black Snowboard of Death. Cokeguard's been putting a beat down on jumps with that thing for years. And then if you're a female, the Birds of a Feather is beloved. That board is awesome. I'm also hearing the newcomers to Capita are loving the Aeronaut, the Megadeth, and the Spring Break Resort Twin. You might see Joey Fava crab walking down the hill on that thing, putting a beat down on the steel. He makes that thing look awesome. And for me personally, I love the Navigator. When it comes to riding powder, riding the resort, I ride the 161 or the 164. It's huge, but it's soft. That's what I love about it. It's a big board, but you can still have fun on it. You can still maneuver it around. So the Capita Navigator would be my recommendation for powder. And then for park, I love the indoor survival. Can't go wrong. Great board for presses, great board for park jumps. It's fantastic. And the one thing about Capita that I think is is really special is that their factory is handmade in Austria with 100% clean energy. All the boards are handmade, 100% clean energy. Can't go wrong. They're world-class production over there. They make great snowboards. So check out their new website, uh, capitasnowboards.com or your local snowboard shop and see if you see anything you like. 
I don't think you'll be disappointed. Let's talk about bindings. Let's talk about Union Binding Co. I personally think they make the best bindings on the market. I'm biased, but I think that would be the general consensus amongst most snowboarders. We're talking buttery smooth ratchets. We're talking lots of adjustability. Uh, but most importantly, I love the clean look. Draplin did the logo years ago, and it is strong. I run the white Union Force Classics on some black pants. I think it just looks timeless, personally. But you can't go wrong with any binding in the line. You know, they have a stacked team of riders. We're talking Travis Rice. We're talking Arthur Longo, Kazuhiro Kahubo, Austin Viz, Jess Kimura. The list goes on of just very talented snowboarders. And it's a company that's owned by snowboarders. It's snowboarders that care about this lifestyle we call snowboarding and they invest in it, and they make great products. So if you're interested in getting yourself a pair of bindings, check out unionbindingcompany.com. Check out their whole line. You won't be disappointed. All right, we're going to take a quick intermission here to talk to you about our good friends over at Pub Beer, who just happen to be the official beer of questionable decision-making and cheap fun. That's right. You heard it here first. Whether you're just having a couple, maybe you're watching the game, Pub beer is a great option. Cheap fun. Maybe you need 50. Did you just get dumped? Pub beer's got you covered. Cheap fun. Every time. Pub beer. Um, it was a pretty like surreal experience. I will actually remember this moment for the rest of my life. I remember um, it was so this was in October before the Avalanche incident in December. I got a phone call from Crispin Cannon from King Snow magazine. And I remember I was at my landscaping job cutting grass, and I remember getting this, like, random number pop up on my phone and answering it. And, uh, yeah, he asked me to film for the King Snow movie, and I remember being like, uh, can I get back to you? Because I, I, at that moment, I didn't even know if I was, like, ready to film for a snowboard movie. I was like, these – he, like, told me the roster list, and I was like, these guys are all the dudes I've looked up to and gone to their movie premieres for years. Like, it was a, it was a really surreal experience, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. There were some pranks, too. When you got that wrong number, you initially were kind of mad <laughs> or frustrated. Yeah, there was, the, there was some pranks So this funny story. So I could deep dive into it a little bit. So yeah. in that summer, I started to get uh, some prank phone calls from someone who put my phone number for a free car ad, and my phone was blowing up. <laughs> it was insane. I was, like, freaking out. I later found out who it was. And I got them to take down the ad, and then like a little. Are we? Who, are, we are we naming names? We're naming names. No, no. We'll we'll keep it. We'll okay. keep it under discretion. But then after I found out, like the fucking shithead I was, I think I was twenty at this time. I decided to put an ad out for free wood with his phone number, and his phone blew up. And then in that moment, I had the idea. I was like, wow, his phone number is blowing this blowing up for free firewood this much. So I uh, started like a firewood business selling firewood. And that was actually what helped pay for one of my snowmobiles. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was circle moment. <laughs> it was actually so funny because I lived in a condo at that point in time with no fireplace and I had cords of firewood stacked all around my house and my landlord was losing his mind being like, what are you doing? And I was just like <laughs> running a chainsaw, splitting wood in my backyard. But anyways, get back to the phone call. Crispin calls me. He's like, hey, like I hear you got some like free firewood. And I was like, uh, freaking out because I was like, oh my God, it's, it's going to start again. Like I'm going back into this madness. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of like flipped him off a little bit. And then he was like, no, no, this is Crispin. And I was like, Crispin, he's like, Crispin Cannon from King Snow. And I was like, oh, oh I'm so sorry. And he's like, do you want to film for the King Snow movie? And I was like, uh, can, can I get back to you? It was so fucking funny. That's incredible. And then a star was born, you know? Yeah. A star was born after that first King Snow part. How was, how was going out there and uh, chuck and roasting the powder? Did, did you have your sea legs going? Were you going Tommy Hawk on them or were you going uh, Stewie Stomps on them? Oh, I don't know. It was like, for me, I felt like so lucky because like I got thrown into the best crew that year. Craig took me under his wing and I filmed very closely with Ben Webb, aka Noobs, um, Craig and Mikey Cicerelli. And it was like, so it was like, a f it was so special to me. Like I've looked up to Craig 
my whole entire life. One of the reasons why I got into snowboarding and to be able to like film with him for my first movie in the backcountry was just something special. And that like that year and currently I was just trying to be a sponge and taking all the little information I could get. And I was just like, I was just so green and happy to be out there that if I got a clip or no clip, I didn't really care. But you were so sick because you'd put in the work on your snowmobile and like Whistler's different from other places when you're filming is like you have to be sufficient on your machine, right? You have to be good at it. And you were so good at it already. Like you could go anywhere. We didn't have to be like, oh, we can't go here or here because Sean's not going to make it. You were making it everywhere we were going. And, uh, you know, you were you were great on your snowmobile. So it was like an absolute dream to, to film with you. And you also have... Um, excited eyes i call it when like somebody's been out there for the first time they're like let's do this let's do this let's do this as opposed to like ah done that done that done Salty that dog. yeah yeah and and like both are good and at some aspects but it was like really fun and refreshing um but i think i want to talk about you i wasn't there on your very first day but i think you had a very special first day filming for the kingstone movie oh thanks craig yeah uh my first day was a pretty i'll, I'll actually remember that day forever in my snowboarding um, we went to a very famous spot called Hollywood Cliffs and Perfect Jump. They're like Whistler staples. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy day. I was there with Jody Washniak, Bo Bishop, and Matt Belzil. And our Hollywood Cliffs, if you know anything about Whistler, it's a far sled. It's like an hour and 40 minutes. And I remember getting there and being like, where the fuck are we? We're like <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. I was already like... Go to the point, I was like kind of scared and out of my element, and I had spent a lot of time on my sled the year before, and I was lucky enough to tee up Hollywood Cliffs with Bo, and me and him went back to back and got two shots each. What are, what are we talking? Fill us in. I think Bo hit it first and did a switchback one, then I went second and did a switchback, or back seven, and then Bo did a back one and I did a switchback five. And I remember, like, it was just everything was clicking. We had Aaron Leyland, like, absolute legend, filmed, like, some of my favorite snowboarders all the time. And he was on sticks, and we had Crispin shooting photos. And Matt Belzo did a back rodeo seven tail that day, which ooh, isn't ooh, ooh. NBD. And it was just, like, one of those moments we're all at the bottom giving each other hugs and high fives, and it was amazing. And then going into perfect jump right after that was crazy because, like, I had never hit any sort of – real backcountry features before then. I mean, the, I mean, you're going about as slow as you possibly can on your snowboard on Hollywood Cliffs and then about as fast as you possibly can on perfect jump. So <laughs> wild way to start. Yeah. Well, that was the craziest thing for like hitting Hollywood Cliffs because you drop like literally like five to 10 feet before the takeoff and you're going a kilometer an hour and have to like two foot hop. And I remember <laughs> just being like, dude, are you sure I'm even going to make it off the takeoff from here? Like this feels insane. But uh, I was like, yet again, I was so lucky. Bo like, co like, talked me through everything and what to expect, and it was just perfect. And then like, so you're batting a thawi too, just two two jumps, two lands yeah. at this point. <laughs> you went into the Whistler backcountry, hundred percent landing average. Uh, Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunted. Do you have any idea how easy this is for me right there? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no. Wait till you the rest of the winter. I did not. I got Tommy. I got put in the washing machine okay. for sure. Um, and then we like went to perfect jump and built it and I'd never hit a jump that big ever and lost to Rochambeau and had to go first. And it was just like the whole day was so special. Actually, crazy story about that day. Matt Belzil broke his arm and sledded home one handed an hour and 45 minutes. It was it, the whole day was just insane. It was like a fever dream. That's Matt. So ba Matt Belzil does back rodeo seven tail grab, one of the best tricks ever fucking filmed on a snowboard of all time. And then, like a true fucking legend, snowmobiles one armed all the way home. Was it Rutherford? Where is that? Uh, that's Brandywine. Brandywine. Like, well, don't, blow it, don't blow it up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone yeah. knows where Hollywood is these days. If you want to go hit it, go hit I it. Know, I'm, I'm a bit of a jokester. <laughs> Um, but it was actually funny because for the rest of the year, anytime we went out there, everyone was trying to sled home one handed. So you just saw a bunch of snowboarders sledding home from the Callahan one handed in Ode to Matt. Damn. So you went first on Perfect Jump, too. Yeah, talk, uh, talk us through uh, you shitting your pants at the top of the Perfect <laughs> Jump. Yeah. Not literally, but this is brought to you by the pens. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a funny scenario because we did Rochambeau and I won, and I was like, 
boys, like, I haven't hit a jump like this. You're telling me I got to go first? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And they were like, yet again, so good. They were like, no, just drop from here and go dead straight. And like, like they said, it was perfect, perfect speed and everything worked out. And Tray bomb? Yeah, I did a tray bomb. Front three? Yeah. Uh, what happens if you knock on that thing just out of curiosity? You do break Ma- your arm. <laughs> break your arm. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly yeah. Matt did a back five to knock to punch a snow or an arm break. Yeah. But like, dude, what a boss. You break your arm in the backcountry. And, and originally we were gonna get him to a spot where we could get a heli to heli him out. And he just didn't stop. He just kept going. And we would be like sliding by him and we'd be like, You're good, and you're just nod his head. Hour and forty five, one pull. Gladiator. Yep. Yeah. True warrior. Whooped out or groomed? How we how's the, how's the trail looking? It was super mellow because it was like full pow that day, so it was only our trails in. And I think the, the boy, I was in the back because at that point I was still trying to get the it's way day one. Of the land. Yeah, it was literally, <laughs> day literally one. your day one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they've been <laughs> <laughs> not a ton of experience. Like that. <laughs> But they were, uh, like, built a nice little train track for Matt out. But, yeah, that was, like, dude, it was one of the most special days. And, like, to have those boys there, it was just truly a dream come true. So pretty much steady decline since day one. <laughs> yeah, steady. I don't think I've got three. I don't think I've got three shots in one day since. God. Incredible. So the rest of the year, you're uh, violently tommying, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, violently tommying, losing my goggles. I think we actually went back to perfect jump two more times that winter and I didn't get a shot on it. <laughs> I think I violently tommied every nice. single time. But it was like, I was just so fucking happy to be out there. Like, I was just like, so grateful for that opportunity and I was just like, this is the best thing ever. Hey, uh, Silk, we got a Patreon question that we could maybe uh, queue up right now. What are we thinking, Benny Pellegrino? I was actually thinking the one that was hilarious on mm, there. Okay, Jesse Korea, thank you so much for your question. Thank you all of our Thanks Patreon for, members. Thank you to our Patreon members. We appreciate you. Uh, Craig, do you yeah. want to maybe uh, plug our Patreon members potentially? Just Absolutely. Kind of show you, your appreciation. The foundation in which this house is built on is the Patreon members. Um, you are all for this. We love you so very much. And, um, you know, I just... You guys plant the seeds, you harvest the rewards. So keep asking questions. Uh, Jesse Correa, Benny Pellegrino, so many more names that we can go in there. Okay, this question is from Jesse Correa. Jesse says, Ooh. is e-biking violently hungover, gnarlier than hitting stepmother? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Shout out Jesse, uh, local Whistler legend, works at the snowboard shop there. He's seen me ride my e-bike violently hungover a couple times this summer. But uh, I wouldn't say the the hangover e bikes the sketchy one. I think the the after the bar after a bunch of drinks mm. is uh, probably way gnarlier than hitting uh, stepmother. We actually, me Darcy and our friend Marcos had a little bit of an e bike crash this summer after mm, tuck the front a little tuck the front scenario. Yeah, a little OTB over the bars. Okay, over yeah, the bars. Yeah, we thought we were. Uh, the what's the bike racing called? Motocross? No, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you're in Supercross? Uh, the the fast one, you know, the crotch rockets. Oh, MotoGP. Yeah, we thought we were MotoGP people on our little e bikes there, and on the little trail side by side, that's not the ticket. I'm gonna tell you that. You guys are banging bars, tuck the front. Yeah, you know, but we learned our lesson the hard way. So don't delete can and then ride. E bikes get going fast. Oh yeah, they get cooking. They're sick. Honestly, from my house, it's just as fast. Ride my e-bike. Like, I ride that thing everywhere in the summer. It's the best thing ever. Mm-hmm. E-bike in the winter. How do you feel about that? <laughs> no, you'll check. catch me in my truck. Okay. I'm <laughs> Miss a little, me with that. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a little bit of a diva, and uh, I don't think I would do well in the cold on the bike. Yeah. Not a lot of traction in the front end as well. Fighting to fighting to keep the front. All right, let's keep things moving. So you're you're also in this King Snow movie. Uh, I saw a great video where you got surprised. You had a little surprise party. Yeah, um, that was that was like one of the most special days. Um, uh, King Snow was lucky enough to surprise me with a cover amongst all my snowboard idols for the movie before it came out. We did a little private premiere in Squamish. And I remember I was sitting next to Mikey Renz and Mark Solers, and I was just losing my mind. I was, like, feeling so honored to be, like, in this movie with some of the people I've looked up to and who have inspired me. And I was, like, sitting next to some of the people that I've looked up to for years, 
And after the movie, Crispin called me up and he was like, hey, like, Sean, we want to give you a little gift. Um, it was your first movie and we're just like stoked for you. Like, here it is. And I remember I like got up to the front and I just like thanked everyone for having me. And I was like going to walk off with the little bag. And he's like, no, no, open it. And I like opened it and pulled up like a, a cover of King Snow magazine. And it was, I remember I just like bursted into tears. It was, I was so happy and all my friends were there and it was just such a special moment. And I had a phone call with my mom and dad after and it was just, it was just so amazing. I was just, I couldn't believe it. What was the photo again? It was a front three on a step down in Whistler that um, actually, I think that year was the first time it had ever been hit as well. So it was pretty special. Incredible. Yeah. And uh, I think I think this is a great. I got a couple stories first. We'll do the front threes. When you're hitting step downs, it's so hard to spin slow, and I feel like on perfect jump and that step down, and maybe on stepmother too. There's been some front threes where you add some style, but there's also like, ooh, I might be spinning a little too much and bring it back. Uh, was that kind of what was happening on that front three or no? Oh yeah. So that front three, like at the start, like when you had step downs, actually a great piece of advice Mark Solers told me was when you hit a step down always think about doing a 180 less because it's always going to feel like you're falling farther than you actually are. And this was, I didn't hear this advice till later on, but <laughs> I, as you can tell, yeah. but like that was a classic moment of a little bit too much mustard and yeah. just holding on for dear life. Honestly, the first, that first year I was holding on for dear life on everything I hit. Don't overcook the turkey. Speaking of holding on for dear life, um, that first year we also had a very funny now it's funny. At the time, it was a little stressful uh, getting out of a zone called the Coop in Whistler. <laughs> yep. So that first year, we went to a zone called Coop, and it was late. Like, it's far out there. It's like another hour, hour 15 sled. The bring extra gas situation. Oh, yeah. We burnt, I think we burnt our whole tanks and a 10-liter Jerry each. But it was like getting late, and me, Mikey, and Craig could not get out of the zone. The zone and Ben Webb. Ben, ben Webb Web. had also the heaviest backpack known to humankind at the time and i feel like filmers get a hall pass on that situation because oh, of their percent. yeah no i'm not saying it yeah. bad way i was just saying like we the, the chips were against us you know oh yeah i did not think that day we were getting out of there it was uh it was a good test on uh, the cruise morale by the end by like the fifth try trying to pull up that hill everyone was kind of like a little frustrated and a little stressed but it was like another like great learning lesson you just gotta like roll with the punches and take everything as it comes it was a classic of just like when you're going into a new zone, just make a nice track down. It was, we got really excited. Five snowmobiles are just like weaving through the trees downhill, which is super fun. And then all of a sudden it's like almost sunset. Everybody's really tired. There's no specific track up. Everybody's getting bounced around because it's all frozen in there. So that was a good learning one for, for both of us, I think. And that this was is, uh, was this naturally aspirated time or we, uh, we have turbos going? I think me and Mikey were NAs. We didn't we didn't join the Turb squad yet, but Craig was on the Turb. Yep. We were on the Turb. We got out of there eventually, but it was uh that was a funny one that just came to mind from the King Snow year. Yeah. It was a little stressful. <laughs> Squeezing the stick a little tight, if you will. <laughs> we were gripped. Yeah, we were gripped. Great. Yeah, great advice. I love that. Uh how's the kid on the on the rooster? Incredible. You put in the work. I said that before. You put in the work and you're rewarded. The clips come when you are sufficient in the backcountry. And I think you put in the work and, and the clips came that first year, you know? You see so many people like, oh, it's my first year. And they'll get like two clips or three clips a full winter, you know, where you had a you had a great little part there, you know? Like I thought it was awesome. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Appreciate it. So so this King Snow part uh, comes out. You're riding, I noticed you're riding all Burton head to toe in that thing. What What happened with the switch? One thing that's so important with me is like, I want to be with a brand and like have it feel like family and friends first. And I, I just was not feeling. I think that that's, that was a really wise decision. If you look at where you're at right now too, because there is something that Burton like really takes care of their riders and they give a lot of firepower behind their riders in a lot of ways, but definitely like when someone's Burton head to toe there, there doesn't feel like there's a, that many lanes where you on the nitro with the arteriks, you got the scratch. It's like, there's, there's like a different flavor to it. Yeah. And it just like each one of the, my brands now, like just want me to be me. And they're so happy. We're like, and honestly, like Burton didn't fucking care about me. They like, they didn't even support me to be in the King Snow movie, nor to care if I was in the King Snow movie. And like, now my company support me in whatever I do, and I'm, like, so grateful. It's, like, the difference in even, like, my motivation. Like, I'm so proud to wear every single company I ride for because they care about me and I care about them, where I just, like, I wasn't feeling that with them. 
Love it. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, it could be time for a very special part of the show here. Uh, this is a trivia situation. It's a special edition trivia. Uh, if I can find the goddamn theme song, here we go. Welcome to Run Through a Wall Trivia. Ooh. So uh, this edition of Run Through Wall Trivia is actually presented by Jody Wachniak, an airtime podcast. He submitted these. Uh, and we also did have a couple technical difficulties. So we're going to have to adjust some of the questions. Uh, we may have already done this segment and we're re-recording it. So we had to pull an audible. Facts. And we have some new questions. But Jody did submit some great questions. Facts. And we're going to do a little combination platter. Facts. Okay. Start off, Craig. Um, okay. If you get the answer wrong, or outside of the allotted time, you will then have to do a run through a wall smelling salt. Let's get you set which, up with some salt. Yeah, let's get you yeah. set up. Let's, because let's clarify, it's a new salt every time, too. It's, it's a brand salt new salt. Time. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. I might hit a little pre-salt, just to kind of fire me up. That's yeah. confident. You're going to want to focus up. You know That's a confident young man. Yep. Whoa! Silk, do you need a salt? I got some. I grabbed okay. some. <laughs> <laughs> Should we hit the eyes? Oh, oh don't yeah. hit the eyes. A little Sasha Barkov. Ah, oh, we don't, we, <laughs> do not, we don't recommend the eyes. <laughs> For not. legal purposes. <laughs> that is uh, viewer discretion advised. All right, ready? Fire me up, Craig. Or do you want to go first? Or you want? I'll go first. Okay. Uh, Sean, can you name each member of the original Forum 8? <sighs> um, J.P. Walker, Jeremy Jones, Devin Walsh, Chris Duffesey. Um, uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh-oh. JP, Jeremy, Chris, Dev. Yep. Why am I blanking? Yeah, three uh, more. Peter Line. Okay, two um, more. Uh, oh, no. Yo- Yoni. Um, <sighs> I think you're missing two. Uh, Bjorn. Yeah, there's one more. Um, d- 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 <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. Has it been five seconds yet? Oh it's no. It's been five seconds. You're oh. fired. Oh, that's not My good. My streak red just went way yeah, down. I'm so good. sorry. Stocks down. Uh, and the, the one you're missing was Vile. <sighs> um, Craig, go ahead. Uh, name a trick Mikey Rents has done on Perfect Jump. That's an easy one. Front 10 double melon. Nice. Ooh. X Games Real Snow to Trevor Andrew. Facts. Fire off another one, Craig. Uh, what are the best snowmobiles? Ski do. <laughs> nice. Another one. <laughs> that was correct. awesome. Wow. What year did Darcy Sharp win gold at X Games? Uh, 2022. Uh, the year would be 2020. Hit assault. Whoa. Go ahead, Craig. Name a trick that Devin Walsh has done on form step down in the movie Double Decade. Back Rodeo 7. Facts. Wow. Great. That clip is incredible, by the way. It's unbelievable. And then can we just piggyback that? Name a trick that Ika Backstrom has done on Form Step Down. Uh, back Rodeo or Switchback Rodeo? You got to you gotta be... You have Very to, specific. You have to be specific. You can't uh, just throw out uh, 20 tricks. Yeah. Just, uh, I a backside. No, no, no. I know <laughs> it's... Fun backside. I know uh, it's... Uh, front side uh, it's a back rodeo, right? It, you're close. You're in the family. Uh, Switchback Rodeo. Yes. Yeah, Switchback Rodeo 7. Okay, I couldn't remember because he does one on Whitey Gap. (laughs) (laughs) The Switchback Rodeo 7. Technically, that is, I think when I say Switchback Rodeo, I think 5, but. Wait, it was a Switchback Rodeo 7? Yeah, it's fucking 7. Yeah. Okay, so it was, he does do a Switchback Rodeo 5 on a jump called Whitey Gap. Yes. And what movie is that one? I Uh, can't remember the movie, I'm sorry. I can't remember, but I know he does a 6 Switchback Rodeo on What's Whitey Gap. Again, that's, I don't think that's the same as the forum step down, but I no. But I mixed up those <laughs> clicks. Give me a break, Chris. I got a brain of a wrong. goldfish, We're dude. Ruthless. I'm sorry. I'm American. I'm not kind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Canadian. Sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> Did you see the, the merch? Did he, I show you the merch I made for Jody? No. Oh, my God. He, uh, he just texted me hashtag sorry with a Canadian logo on it, and I just whipped up this T-shirt. Just <laughs> <laughs> with a little airtime logo. It's so sick. <laughs> Hopefully, Jody sells those. Uh, I think they'd go. A little commission for a little for No, I don't need commission. I don't need commission. All right. Four fifths. Fire it up. I'm sorry. I won't be. I'll be more Canadian. Name. I'll be, I'll be kind. Name four riders in Eight Mile. Oh, um, 
Dustin Craven, Mikey Renz, oh, uh, Mikey Renz, Earl Nimala, and Did uh, you say Earl Nimala? Earl, yes, that's correct. <laughs> it's Earl Nimala, yeah. Earl <laughs> Nimala <laughs> and um, I love that show. Chuck, name's Earl. Chuck White. Ooh, nice one. Chucky, Deep shout cut. out Chucky. Shout out Chucky. Yes. Street cred slowly rising back. Slow, up. Oh, it's, yeah, it's it climbing. It's climbing. Yep. Uh, name one nickname for Mikey Renz. <laughs> Five, four. Three, I don't know. I don't know what to be honest with you. I mean, I like to refer to him as the big wig personally. Yeah, the big dog. Yeah, I didn't know that. I'll take a hit. What about yep. fluffy, fluffy man Lafleur? Mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> All right. I'm sorry, Mikey. Yep. <laughs> what trick did Mikey Cicerelli do on the Hurley Gap? Cab five. Nice. Off, off the, the toes. Off the what? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember when he came home that day and uh, showed me that clip. He gave me a little leak, and I was so hyped for him. You got another Hurley Gap question? Uh, no. I have a Hurley Gap question. Oh, no, not Hurley Gap. Uh, Grizzly Gap. Yeah. Sometimes known as Dekine Gap, I think. Yep. After you. What trick did Devin Walsh do on Dekine Gap, a.k.a. Grizzly Gap, in that, the forum video? Oh, was it a back one? No, back five. Put those ba- together. Yeah, add them together. Back seven. That's yeah. correct. Oh, <laughs> I'll take a hit. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got it. there. <laughs> You'll get there. Is that all of our trivia? That's all I got. Oh, I'm what sorry, are the best Dev, snowmobiles you're, again? You're a I'm legend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Dev. Okay. I've watched that part enough. His switchback five on Mother. He did a switchback three and a switchback one. Pretty famous. Yeah. Bangers. Exciting news here at the Bombhole. Shredbots is proud to present their latest film, Return, featuring Torstein Horgmo, Mikey Cicerelli, Mons Roisland, Brandon Cocard, Brandon Davis, and Raibu Katayama. Pretty stacked roster. The world premiere is November 21st in Denver at the Ellie Calkins Opera House. It's going to be a community gathering, a night to remember, bring a friend, because carpooling is recommended. There's going to be a meet and greet with the riders, product giveaways, and an after party at the Chambers Grant Salon downstairs at the Opera House, open to the first 500 people through the door. You got to be quick. For full tour information, head on over to shredbots.com or the Shredbots Instagram page for all locations and dates. All right, we're going to take a quick break with a message from our good friends over at Mammoth Mountain. Opening day, right around the corner, Friday, November 15th. Mark your calendars. It's coming up quick. And exciting news, there's big changes coming to the Unbound Terrain Park, specifically Main Park. It's going to have a brand new layout. You've never seen it like this before. It's going to be spicy. You're going to want to check it out. they got more jumps, new features, and over a dozen new jibs. Also, there's been a bit of a rumor going around that Mammoth is bringing back the Hemlocks. If you don't know what that is, it's on the backside of the mountain. You're going to have to unstrap a little bit, but trust me, it's going to be worth it. Picture this, a freestyle big mountain paradise with a little bit of help from Park Crew. If you're interested, snag some preseason savings before November 18th and save up to 52% on tickets and lodging deals. That's more than half. For more information, head over to mammothmountain.com. Now, do you find yourself slowing down a little bit in your older age? Maybe getting off hill a little earlier? Well, you could be dehydrated. 75% of Americans are dehydrated. And that goes up when you're at elevation, when you're in the mountains. So I drink Bub's Hydrate or Die Hydration Packets. There's 2,000 milligrams of electrolytes. There's no added sugar. There's no artificial flavors. Let me tell you, when I'm hydrated, I ride better. I can ride longer. I have more energy. All in all, my vitality is just better. So if you're interested in picking up some Bub's Naturals Hydrate or Die, head on over to bubsnaturals.com and use promo code BOMHOLE for 20% off your order. And stay hydrated, people, with Bub's Naturals, Hydrate or Die. Okay, so you film King Snow, you get a cover, kid's feeling good, he's just switched over, he's riding nitros, 
um, New Year, New Me scenario. And then uh, Craig, Craig Mick, did you give him a jingle for fixing, or how did how did that come to fruition? Absolutely. I mean, I think we had so much fun with the King Snow Year. We had a great crew with Ben Webb in the backcountry, and I said, let's run it back. Um, so then we did fixing, and you were a major part of that film. Opened it up um, with one of the savagest, most savage front threes I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Craig. It yeah, went that, viral. That was an amazing year. Like, yet again, like getting the film with you was so, so special. And we had like such a good crew. It was really me and you kind of really teamed up. And we had Ben Webb, who is the man. He is so fun to be with in the backcountry. He always keeps vibes so light and just like loves being out there and loves having fun. And it was like really, it was tons of fun. It was a little bit of a bad snow year that year. So you, I think you were in the streets at the beginning of the year. And I was really, I was lucky enough that I was able to sneak out for a couple of days with the man boys. And then me and you spent the second half and everything was just like, it was fun. At that point, I was kind of just going through the motions. Like I was just like, well, I get to do this now. Like, this is so fun. Like I'm filming and like, I felt a little less green. Like I kind of knew what to expect. And yeah, it was just so much fun. Sick. And that's kind of how your relationship with the man boys started, right? Is like kind of like a couple of days within that season, we were going out a lot. I got hurt kind of at the end. So I think you went out with the man boys on that, uh, 360 day. I know I wasn't there. Yep. So yeah, that was exactly what happened. I did a couple of days early season with them and then me and you locked in. And then when you got hurt, Um, I was lucky enough to roll out with the man boys and yeah, we went and I think I only did the one day. I did two days with them that year. Um, and in the later half of the season, we hit stepmother and then there was another day after that. Can you, can you fully break down the stepmother front trace leche to the moon (laughs) viral moment? Kids on the map. Sean uh, Miskman's here. Put the flag in the ground. Situation. <laughs> that was a that was a funny moment. It was uh it was actually <laughs> on uh, four twenty April twentieth. Wow. Uh, Mark Solers birthday as well. Ooh. Or no day before Mark Solers birthday is the day before. Right? No, he is four twenty. Four twenty. Yeah. Yeah. Him and Hitler. <laughs> Same true? Birthday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't be two more and opposite yeah, people. Yeah, they're very opposite people, actually. Yeah. Thanks uh, for clarifying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Felix Baumgartner, uh, the gentleman who jumped out of the space shuttle. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was actually born on 420 in the year 1969, so his yeah. birthday is 42069. Holy shit. What a shit. legendary oh, birthday. That's a fun fact. Yeah. Craig, sure. thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're going to do a front three on stepmother. This yeah. Is, yeah, this is an iconic moment. Focus up here. Focus yeah. up. Um, so, yeah, it was the it was like a sneaky April reset. Like, I don't think we were going to shred before. I went out for a fun day with um, two of my homies, and we just did some fun laps. And I remember having so much fun. And it was like 7.30 when I got to the truck, and I called the boys. I was like, yo, the snow is actually, like, really good out here. I think we could sneak in, like, another day or two. Like, it's fully reset. It's good to go. And that winter, uh, stepmother was starting the form up for the first time in years. And Belzel had talked about hitting it all year. And he was like, would you want to go hit stepmother? And I was like, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, at that moment, I, I like, I was a yes man. I was like, yep. I regretted it that night when I was got home and I like thought about it. I was like, fuck, it's April 20th. I'm going to go hit stepmother. But, um, anyways, we like brave the icy Rutherford whoops overheat a million times we finally get there it's a little later and the clouds were going to roll in the afternoon so we were setting it up in a rush rusty was at the bottom on sticks just giving a shit about not getting it done fast (laughs) enough in classic rusty style (laughs) telling me to hurry up and then it was like all of a sudden the clouds were really starting to roll in and rusty was like you guys got to hit it now so we did a quick rochambeau and i won which was like kind of a thing where every time we hit something that I didn't want to go first on that year, I would win the Rochambeau. And then I like barely, I don't even, I think I might've done a speed check, but like barely had time to do one if that was the case. And then I had like no idea where the drop from, but Matt's such a legend and had hit it before. And he was like, just go from here, drop in. And I remember just like kind of blacking out a little bit and then taking off and doing a front three and looking down and being like, I got to fucking land this or else it's going to suck. Just being like, oh, God, and then landing it. And when I landed, I actually, like, subluxed my shoulder from the impact. It was so gnarly. And then I, like, I felt – it was funny because I felt bad. I, like, 
wanted to do something else on it because I had uh, I like heard rumors that the Burton Squad had hit it before, and I did feel bad about doing it. But it's very rare that that thing forms up, and we just we had to get it done. And then uh, I didn't end up doing it. I didn't even know it was funny. I was kind of like, Rusty, should I like do something else? I didn't know if the style wasn't bad. I didn't know that it was gonna like go viral or anything. But it like all everything worked out. And I just did one and done, and yeah, it was just a crazy day. And um, I was told that you were unsure about this clip. Yeah, I was really unsure because Rusty didn't show me it. And he was just like, no, it's good. I was like, dude, are you sure? Like, are you sure I don't need to do something else? I was like, what if I do this, this, this? And Rusty was like, no, dude, trust it. Like, it's good. And then, yeah, it ended up working out. And I think it will forever probably be my favorite snowboard clip because it was like definitely a clip that kind of like helped my snowboard career tremendously. Um, more than I could have ever imagined. So it was, uh, it was a good day. I love how you were unsure about the clip that might be the best clip you've ever filmed in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You never know in the moment. Like at that point I was like still like I'd done just finishing my second year and I was like, oh, it's just a front three. Like I know the Burton guys probably put a beat down on this thing. And I don't know. I was just like I felt like I wanted something else. But sometimes the simplest stuff works and – it was just the right feature, right time, and everything just kind of like worked out perfectly. Okay, I got a question for you. So when you're you're filming this type of stuff, who filmed that? You said Rusty's on the sticks, right? So uh, Rusty Ogden didn't film you. He's an insane snowboarder, like one of the best to ever do it. I would imagine if it was me going off of a jump, I would feel stupid having him film me because he's so fucking good. How How is it having Rusty film you knowing that he's, a weapon on the snowboard. It's hilarious. He lets me know all the time. We'll be building a <laughs> jump and sometimes he'll be I'll be like, "Oh, I think I'm going to do this." He'll be like, "Dude, I did that 10 years ago. Pick a better <laughs> trick." He lets you know, but it's also like the best. Like I feel like it's the best of both worlds cuz cuz he's such a weapon. He knows how to build the jumps. He knows how to pick the spots. He knows what tricks work best on it. So he kind of like as well as gives me the shit sometimes. He like takes me through the steps and coaches me through it, which is like kind of a dream scenario. You have someone who actually has done so much in the Whistler backcountry and has so much experience physically doing it and is now a filmer. He's like, if I f film it from here and you do this trick and we build it like this, it's going to work out really good. And he's like throwing up assists all the time on my shots. Like he's the fucking man behind it all. Um, when you talk about walking you through or like um, helping you, assisting you, is there a specific feature trick that comes to mind that you're like, yo, I don't know if I would have got this without Rusty Ockenden? Um, Kind of like all, like most of them, like <laughs> pretty much, yeah, <laughs> all. pretty much my whole career. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. But like, there's like a big one. Uh, I'm trying to think. I did a front 10 at the end of 10 where he was like, Woo. he told me, <laughs> like, he was like, I told him I really wanted to do a front 10. He's like, we'll go here. I'll build, like, we build this like this. It's great for doing a front 10. And I remember thinking he was insane because the feature was nuts. That's the run into a wall, sh like, shoot straight up, come straight down jump, right? Yeah. Okay. And, like, he was, and then he was like, if you we build it like this, I know the perfect spot. Like, that was, like, a huge he lobbed that one up for yeah, me. Yeah, that was kind of, they use the exact specifications as aerial ski jumps, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. dude, it was so funny. When we were building that jump, I was, cr I was like crying laughing while building why that were jump. You, why were you laughing? Oh, we maybe were a little bit under the influence. <laughs> okay. Okay. The altered mind state. Yeah. I like that. Continue. Um, and I was just like, we were building, I was like calling it, because we built it and then went the next day to hit it. And I remember just like, laughing and being like this is insane dude like it looks like i'm gonna land back in the takeoff Bo hit it first and just did a backy and i remember just being in the gut of the jump and just he took off and i just started crying laughing <laughs> colin adair didn't even show up because he didn't think the jump was gonna work but sure enough like the jump worked perfect it was amazing and uh it was actually funny during while doing that front 10 i uh I stopped the session halfway through. I did like four tries and then I let Rasmin keep hitting it. And then I went back and got it after sitting for like an hour and a half. Was it Rusty who was like, hey, I'm tapping you back in? Or, or was it you or like, how did that work? 
Because uh, usually for people that have never been in a backcountry session, like when you stop, you usually stop. Yeah, well, me and Rusty kind of talked about it because like I was like a little close, but it was like kind of hard because me and Raz were going back and forth and Raz's speed was a little different than mine. And Raz was going to the right and I was going to the left and he was, Razman was really close too. And I was like, we kind of both made the team decision. I was like, Razman, you go. And then I'll tap back. I was like getting tired too. And I was like, if I'm feeling it in a few minutes, like after you're done getting your trick, I'll tap back in. And it just like kind of worked out perfect. I like had a moment to take a breath, reset my brain, visualize it, and then went back. That was a very special trick. For me, just because years ago, I broke my leg on that and hadn't done it since. Front end double, that thing's iconic, dude. That was an ender too, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Peter. Uh, I had another note on my notes about filming with Craig for fixing with a launch back 1080 in there too. <laughs> oh, yep. Um, that was actually, I think that was, I did two days with the man boy, or three days with the man boys that year. And that back 10 was with them. It was like a random day. They had called me Craig. You were, you were, that was early season. I think you were filming in the streets at loyal that time. Loyal to Steel at that time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're a loyal, you're, you're a loyal a loyalist. To the steel. Yeah. Well, sh- also shout out to you, Craig. Not many people film in the backcountry and ride steel at the same time. So that's, that's very, very impressive Respect. to do both. Thank you. Thank you. Not many people do back tens as big as you did on that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. I got a question. Let's just, let's just talk about this for a second. So you grew up, your roots, um, going on a drop and ramp, sliding some steel. Nowadays, you're riding the park. You going around the steel, or are you you putting up back lips? What are we What are we talking? I'm guilty. I go around the steel. You're riding around. You're riding around the steel. Yeah, I. I so like, you've forgotten your roots. No, you no. Forgot where you came from. I'm so, I'm sorry. I know you're loyal <laughs> to the steel, but I like to keep my base nice and fresh. Oh, it's you a know? base thing. It's, it's a base. You know, it's a base and like, situation. Also, yep. spatial issues. Yep. I see a bunch of the old vets going around the steel, and mm. I kind of, you know, I look up to them a little bit. I'm guilty. Na- name, I feel bad. Name three. Put them on blast. Who's going around the steel? Mark Solers, Chris Rasman. Uh, Mikey goes around the steel sometimes Mikey's now. Mikey's always gone around the steel. Oh, Mikey Cicerelli. Cicerelli was getting down on the steel yeah, when he Cicerelli was here. Cicerelli would get down He's on the steel. No, no, Mikey he, Renz. Mikey Ren- Renz goes around Renz the steel. Is, oh, yeah. He yeah. had a box when he was here, by the, for the record. We went to Woodward, but anyway, continue. <laughs> So I have, uh, he went on record jibbing when I saw him. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'm just kind of, just curious, just curious, you know? Hey, just wonder why it? you go around it. It's fine. It's not a fucking cone. It's a goddamn rail. Just slide the thing. All right, let's keep it going. I, wait, wait finish, we- finish your back 10 story, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Back to the back 10 story. Um, yeah, that was just, like, another lucky day of, it's, like, one of my early, it was, like, pretty early on in the winter. Craig was still filming. The man boys called me up. We didn't really know what to do, and that was like another day where things just aligned, like worked out perfect. It was like a pretty mellow jump in terms of like not many hazards, as you could say. Like there wasn't like a crazy like death gap you had to get over to, and it was pretty straightforward. You drop from the roll and let her rip, and I think I think I did a back seven and then did the back ten right after, and it just like kind of lined up, and it's one of those ones where – Everything just kind of – sometimes things just click. It's it's super funny in the backcountry. Sometimes you just have those moments where you lock in and you're able to kind of zone in. That was one of them. So that was your introduction to the man boys. Uh, we did talk about them earlier, but we do have a guest question from Rusty Ockenden. Here we go. Hey, bombhole. Oh, hey, Sean. <laughs> Sean, it's your filmer calling. Uh-oh. Oh, no. What am I going to do? What am I going to say that embarrasses you publicly or gets you in trouble? Are you squirming over there, squirming in your little chair? Well, guess what, Sean? I'm not here to do that today. I'm here to pump your tires. So I'm going to start by saying, wow, you have great style. And I'm not just talking about hitting a jump or doing a trick. I'm just talking about boarding in general. You got fucking flow. You look sick. uh, And I'm interested where that came from. Is that from riding more free ride than park? Is it from pulling from other riders that you grew up watching? Uh, Is it from surf? Well, no, it's not from surfing. I've seen you surf. Uh, But yeah, I would like to know where you've pulled your style from because it's one of the best parts about your snowboarding and it's why I love pointing a camera at you. So yeah, I'll leave it with that. Stoked to listen to the pod. I love you, buddy boy, and I will see you soon. 
Oh, thanks, Uncle Rusty, for the kind words. Uh, you're the man, and I miss you. Um, so, like, in my snowboarding style, like, it's the most important thing to me. Like, I look up to so many snowboarders who have good style, and I, like, I feel like that's really what separates certain snowboarders. Like, at the end of the day, anyone could do frontside 1080, but being able to ride down the mountain in, like, a flowy, smooth fashion is, like, what separates the good from the great. And I look up to Mikkel and Nico so, so much. And those are two who ride the mountain with such flow and finesse. And I think a lot of that comes from just like being OCD obsessive about their riding and just taking inspiration and trying to put my own little twist on it. Well said. Very well said. Those two have good style. Amazing style. <laughs> there, It goes back to like being the ball. If you watch those two... Maybe Nico like rides very like across the mountain. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that I've like gained inspiration from where I've been trying to work on. Like you don't just ride straight down, like you cross court and that opens up so many more takeoffs and landings. Like if you're looking straight down, your options are way more limited. And then if you're trying to like horizontally cross the mountain and then your slough is running down, it just like was like something I had heard. Um, and maybe a, some Nico video or something. And I've like taken that inspiration and really trying to put that into my snowboarding on its own, as well as like Mikkel. And when you watch him, he's not just like pointing straight down. He's like moving diagonally across the slope. I like that take. And one thing that I've noticed from your riding is, uh, you are kind of wise beyond your years on your snowboard because you're in a semi-exclusive club with the, the natty back sevens, uh, that, you know, you're in good company if you got a natural back seven in your video part. It's generally the elites that are doing those, and I think that comes from riding things cross court like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to ask where you get the inspiration from that, but uh, it sounds like you already kind of explained it. Yeah, it's like one of those things where, like, I feel like being able to ride something natty is kind of like the pinnacle of snowboarding. Because if you ride like a cheese wedge, like you can make mistakes and recover on your takeoff. But like when you ride something natty, you have to be, there's no room for error. Like you have to be dialed in and like be able to kind of like visualize it before you go because you're not doing a run in. Like you have to learn how to be like soft on your feet on the takeoff and like have those little finesses. So that's like one big thing I'm like really trying to push myself in is like, doing stuff more natty. I still like, I'll always be a cheese wedge and step down dog, but I really want to push myself more into that to kind of like grow that aspect because it just like, you could see anyone at the end of the day could probably hit a cheese wedge, but not anyone at the end of the day could ride stuff natty properly. Absolutely. And this might be an ice cold take, but I, I, I think that sometimes um, snowboarders are a little guilty of getting almost too niche where they're, they, it's like, I, this is what I do in snowboarding. And it's like, hey, it's already very niche. Like the backcountry is there's so few days out there. Like you have to be able to do it all. And I think, um, you know, your latest video part, you got a front 10 double off an aerials jump and then you also have a natty back seven, you know, like I think that's very, very special. And, I, and I've seen you develop that part. Of, you've worked on that part of riding. Thanks, Greg. Well, yeah, I just think snowboarding is so niche, and I actually take that from Rasmin a lot. He's like, big-ass step down, Rasmin will hit it. Big-ass jump, he'll hit it. Then he rides, like, natty lines, mini golf, pillow stuff. It's just, like, you got to do it all, and, like, there's, like, like you said, so far few in between good days. Like, conditions don't line up all the time. Like, we've had some bad winters the past few years, so, like, when it's good and something's in front of you and presents itself, like, you got to take it. And if you're just like pigeonholed into one lane, then you're just taking away your opportunities at the end Mm -hmm. of the day. I'd love to talk about the learning curve of actually like a natty back seven or whatever, or like natural freestyle, whatever. Right. Cause there, you can't just go out there and try something like 10 times like you could on a park jump or a pat down. I feel like it's a big time trial and error situation. Like you figure out, okay, this doesn't work. I got to go twice as fast. And then, but th- there's really no way to figure out how to ride natural stuff without actually doing it. Have you had some error in the trial and error of figuring out how to do natty freestyle? Oh, yeah. I've, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. In between the very few natty shots I have is about a million fuck ups. <laughs> but uh, one uh, notable one was it was actually two days after the stepmother clip. I tried to do a natty back seven off of a step down. And at this point I didn't really understand 
like the like riding sideways. I was like looking straight down the mountain, like and tried the natty back seven a hit where you had to go really, really slow off of it. And I took too much speed and did a natty six thirty to the bottom of the landing. And I kneed myself in the face and shattered my orbital bone. And it was a pretty hectic scenario that I never thought I would ever end up in. But like I said, I'm so grateful to have the amazing, like the best crew you could ever have in the backcountry for that sort of thing. Like that everyone works so well. And unfortunately I had to get airlifted out um, to Whistler and then I had to go to Vancouver for surgery where I got three plates and 16 screws in the right side of my face. Became a, a little MF doom. But I have like a plate and five screws in my eye right here, a plate and five in my eyebrow, and a plate and six in my jaw. Jeez. So it's uh, it was it wasn't like for me the one thing it was like a little bit of a scary scenario. But like I remember opening my eyes and seeing Jody and Mark Solars above me, and like all I could think of was like I'm in good hands. I trust these guys with my life. They'll take care of me. And like talking about nailing a rescue. They fucking nailed it. Within two hours, I was burritoed up in the chopper out of there. But there's actually some notable things now looking back on it. Like, for example, it was April 22nd that day. It was a warm day. Like, it was like floating around freezing level. And I got so cold so instantly. So that's a little safety thing to kind of like touch on was like, make sure you have lots of extra layers out there as well. Another notable thing I remember actually from that situation was I remember laying down in the snow and I was like kind of like struggling to keep my eyes open and like kind of like stay with it. I was like kind of like going into a little bit of shock. And I remember at one point I opened my eyes and there's two different kind of helicopters. There's the BC ambulance heli and the SARS heli. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing the BC ambulance heli, which can't land in the mountains and freaking out. But that whole time the boys saw me look at that and explain to me the situation. I couldn't talk at that moment because my jaw was all banged up. And uh, that's like another thing. Like they were so good at communicating with me the whole time. And then, yeah, it was funny. I actually remember too when I got in the helicopter – I uh, played Through the Wire by Kanye West the whole way to the hospital. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Damn. You just have it loaded up? or? Uh, well, yeah, because I was listening. <laughs> I was vibing to that album for a lot throughout the winter, and I was listened to it a bunch. And I, like, had enough at that point when I got into the helicopter. Like, the blades are spinning. I had, like, enough, like, idea to, like, pull out my phone. And I also wanted to, like, look at myself and like kind of get a group. I was like, Hey, I'm going to fly into Whistler. Did you have like a passcode or did it recognize your face? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> basically my face looked like the Hulk punched in my face. It definitely did not recognize it. I had a little bit of a droopy eye. Man. I was like down in that zone, Ugh. but it was like another learning lesson. Like from that moment, like everything happens for a reason. Like, I learned the hard way that day to like, because I think I was running a little bit off of adrenaline too as well, because we had hit stepmother two days before. And I had this like weird feeling in the morning as well. And I didn't trust my intuition. I never spoke up about it. And it was just like, I didn't have the experience to be like, hey, like I'm maybe not feeling this right now. And like the experience to understand that like, hey, maybe this isn't a feature. So like, even though that was such a shitty situation to go through, I like look back on it. I'm like, wow, I actually learned so much from the situation. So like in a weird way, I'm like, it sucks it had to happen, but I learned the hard way and I'm going to do everything I can to not make that mistake happen again. Yeah. A couple contributing factors, right? You land probably one of your best shots of your life two days before. It's also the end of the season. There is that like panic. You kind of got to go a little bit where it's, it, it's very easy to get overtaken, but now you're like, oh no, I can stop. I can think, I can reassess the situation and not be taken, not ride with my heart, but with my brain a little bit more. Totally. I think that's like really, a really important point to say in the backcountry is like everyone, like I'm so hungry out there. Like all I want, I want shots. Like I want to film the best stuff I can, but you like, it's very important to take that step back, check in, yeah. do all those things or else like that's when bad stuff happens is when you're just like rolling with the punches and you're being like, ah, I'm invincible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to have a good beat down every now and then. <laughs> a little reset. Yeah. So going back to one thing you breezed over that they hammer on in these avalanche courses is like extra layers. And you talked about how it was almost 
almost above freezing and you were still cold. So did you, when they burritoed you up, they put you in the bivy or, and then they, you have bl- uh, jackets on top of you and everything and you still got cold? I, I don't really remember how they bivied me, but I remember that we had, cause there was a bunch of people in that zone and they had all saw what happened. It was very obvious that I was fucked up. Yep. So there was a bunch of people that came to help out. Um, JF Pelshat was actually there. Legend. Um, but yeah, they, I just remember them like jamming puffies and everything in me. And like, I was about as layered up as you could ever be. And I was fucking freezing. I was like shivering and it was like warm. The boys were in like long sleeve shirts and I was like covered in puffies and bivvies and every, like, we're so dialed as a crew. Everyone has the most amount of safety gear we could bring. And I was still cold. And that actually changed my mindset a lot on filming on like those really cold days. I now, after that experience, I'm like, hey, like, it's minus 25 out here. Like, maybe let's, like, tone it back a little bit of a notch because I could not imagine if it was minus 25 and I was going through that. Like, it would have been fucking gnarly because it was a sunny April 22nd day. Like, it warms up quick in Whistler, and I was freezing. I couldn't imagine if it was January, minus 25, snowy, like, that's good intel. That's good intel. Now, I got some questions for you here. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been through shoulder surgeries or knee surgeries, and there's a rehab process. Uh, face, face surgery. <laughs> what kind of rehab process are we looking at for that? It was actually, like, so mellow. In terms of injuries, I think it was, like, the best injury to have because I didn't have a concussion because my face acted like a helmet. Um, and basically, like, even four weeks later, I flew to Austria for the Nitro team trip for camp good times. And I was like able to like kind of cruise around and it's been like pretty mellow. My eyes came back. Like my, I had a little bit of weird vision stuff at the start, but that came back, got all the feeling in my face. It's, it's pretty, it was pretty good recovery and sense. Kids back. Face looks good. Face IDs working. Face IDs working. Yeah. Dude, back. The f- it's crazy. My, I never had to switch my face ID. It like, if you look at photos of me before, during and after it's insane. My face, looked like it does now and then my eye was down here and like caved in and then they just like brought it back my surgeon was an absolute legend shout out to that guy because i remember like talking with my mom you could look like sloth from the goonies real quick (laughs) as a bad surgeon oh yeah my mom was like worried i remember talking with my mom before getting the surgery because my i was lucky enough my parents were in vancouver at the time and like i was worried my mom was like just so you know like we i don't know how you're going to look after this. It was like a big question, but like you can't even see my incision marks. Like he did such a good job. He like matched it up with creases in my eyes. Like dude was a technician. He was surgical. He, he was, was literally, literally surgical. He was, <laughs> he was surgical. <laughs> it was nice with the, the surgery. <laughs> All right, let's get into a fun <laughs> section of the show. Silk, do you know what that would be? So I feel like it's probably about time for Name That Video Part. Oh! All right, Sean, this is big for you. Oh, God. (laughs) Huge. Some could say huge. Massive. What's your confidence level? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, I think it's low, Chris. I mean, I I tried to study a little bit before coming here, but I'm about like a 1 out of 10. There's uh, maybe I got it, but. What what is, uh, just out of curiosity, what does studying for Name That Video Part look like? Uh, I tried to watch a bunch of snowboard movies. Well, I kind of figured that one of the boys would give you a movie and I kind of know what are movies that we like tend to run back on snowboard trips. We gave you a meatball. Yeah. Thank thank Lord. (laughs) Oh shit. It's Powderhounds volume two. Second song. First song. Yeah. That first song after the intro. That's a win. That's first song. We'll count it. Yeah. Um, there's actually a clip. I know the part of that song. It's a sledder going up a chute with someone in the middle, and then he gets to the top and gives the fucking fist bump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He knows his stuff, guys. He knows his stuff. Uh, You did win Name That Video Part. We do not have the prize pack for you. Uh, It is in the lobby. It's in the lobby. So congratulations. Oh, thanks, boys. We're not that dialed in. I apologize. Uh, But we will keep it going. Part two of Name That Video Part is for the listeners. If you know the song, Comment on the photo of Sean on Instagram, on the Bombholes Instagram. That is where we pick our winner. And uh, we need song, or no, we need writer and video. Here we go. 
Okay, thank you guys for playing. I don't know if I got that one. They never did. You got that one, Greg? I just I don't want to ruin it for the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> I got it though. Yeah, Canadian rider. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break and talk about Yeti. They got a new cooler. It's called the Roadie 15, and it's perfect for all of your essentials. You can throw it on the front of an ATV, throw it on your paddleboard or a kayak. It's also really light. You can carry it down to your beach, or you can go fishing with it. Great cooler. weighs less than 10 pounds empty. It's also ample space to fit a 12-pack of standard cans with ice. So those bevs stay cold wherever your adventure takes you. They got all types of technology in this thing too. They got the new double duty strap, which means you don't need to use your hands. You can throw it over your shoulder. They got good handles. They got the non-slip feet for the back of your truck. They got a drain plug if you want to hose the thing out if it gets nasty. They got tie down slots. And the best thing about the Yetis is the permafrost in insulation. So they're the best coolers. They keep those bevs ice cold on a hot summer day. Check out their website. If you want to learn more about the Yeti Roadie 15. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk about one of my favorite places that exists on this earth, and that's Woodward Park City. It's fun all seasons. Now, this season is currently mountain bike season, and it's just heating up. They got rad events coming up. They got rebuilt trails, and they got some new multi-week programs for the Groms. Woodward is kicking off some brand new programs for kids as young as three years old starting this fall. Get them started early, skateboarding, biking, scootering, or hitting the trampolines with fun one-hour classes. Also, if you want to sharpen your skills for this winter and learn some tricks on the roller board, which is basically a snowboard with roller wheels, you can chuck carcass into the foam pit. You want to learn backflips? Take it to the foam pit first. So then when the snow hits, you're ready to go. Check the details at woodwardparkcity.com. And get up there and have yourselves a good time. All right, we're going to interrupt this programming to talk about one of my favorite brands, Autumn Headwear. Their motto is Style Matters, and it shows. If you look at their team, they got some of the most stylish riders on the planet. It's rider-owned. This is a brand owned by snowboarders. Brad Allband is the genius behind it. He's done great work over there. And they have great fits on the beanies, most importantly. You know, here at the Bomb Hole, we love what we call a deep resi fit, the reservoir, the reservoir tip, so to speak. So they have the surplus fit, which is kind of a resi. They have the shorty fit, which is shallow. You might catch Silk D wearing one of those. They also have the simple fit that's right in between. And I was just on their website. The apparel is impeccable. So great company, rider owned. If you're interested in getting a great beanie this winter, head on over to autumnheadwear.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order and keep that dome piece looking great with them. Autumn Bonnet. I, I got a question. Oh, uh, Canadians. Canadians, you guys are kind and nice. And, I, I've, you know, you come stay with me. Cicerelli, you guys stay at the house. You guys have great manners. You guys clean up. You're very polite. Just genuine, kind humans. All the Canadians that come stay with me. Uh, Americans, we, we, we're dicks. <laughs> We're dicks. <laughs> like I don't know how else to put it. I try not to be, but it's there's just a part of me that just it just like don't be a dick, don't be a dick, and you know what I mean. Like <laughs> it just comes out of us naturally. Why is that? Why do? Why are you guys nice? I don't know. That's a tough one to answer. I I, t I think it's because you guys got so many fucking people in America. Hundred million people. You could be a dick and you don't have to deal with that person again. Mm. Canada, we don't got that many people. It's a pretty small town, so if you're a little bit of a dick, then you're probably going to bump into him again and be known as the dick around town. That's a great, that's a great theory. Yep. I like that. It's, that's actually perfect. That's the theory. That, that is the sense. theory. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Craig, do you have anything to add to that as a Canadian? Do you want to speak on behalf of your country right now? Uh, just It's a common enemy situation, right? And it's much colder. <laughs> so if, if a nation can unite against a, a common en enemy, everybody's a little bit nicer to each other, I think. So we unite against the cold. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it uh, hopefully breeds niceness. Mm, I like that. That's my take. I do like that. All right. We got some guest questions. Oh, you know what? We got some Patreon questions. Why don't we serve those up, Silk? Yeah, I'm thinking Benny Pellegrino's question. God, those oh, sunglasses look fantastic. Yeah. So. Look I don't know what you're talking about. Amazing. 
Yeah, freshly married. Yeah, freshly married, $5 sunglasses. Okay, Benny Pellegrino, thank you for <laughs> asking a question. Again, always avid Patreon member. Thank you so much, Benny. Thanks, Benny. Shout out, Benny. We love you. Okay, Benny wants to know, coming up in the Whistler area, you must have always heard about the man boys. Tell us how you were let into the squad. You get jumped in, you have to load and unload their sleds, you have to break bottles over your head. What did it take for you to get out there with this highly respected crew? <laughs> Those boys were fucking, they were pretty good. They welcomed me with open arms. But uh, I don't know, I definitely just had to take a bunch of shit from them. That was That was it. They definitely just take the piss out of me and call me a rookie and... Sometimes fuck with me. For a while there, Rusty was putting bananas in my gas cap. So every time I go open the gas cap in my truck, there's a fucking banana peel. A little shit like that. But they're, no, those boys are the fucking best. They just welcome me with open arms. And you can see all that um, jumping in on Clip High, the series. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of YouTube bullying going on there. <laughs> so I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, shout out Clip High. If you ever watch them, they're like behind the scenes videos of us filming. If you want to laugh at Jody or Stale, they're great. Tune in. <laughs> okay, a uh, couple hypotheticals here. Take Man Boy's primarily backcountry crew. Okay, you remove, you know, Craig, uh, you remove Jody, you leave the rest of the crew. You decide to change gears. You say, hey, we're doing a street video only. Who's getting the last part? Belzo. I'm claiming Belzo. He's riding that park every day. He, like, still rips so hard. And I don't think Raz has got many rail trips. Who's going to film the worst part? That's actually yeah. a better question. <laughs> the worst rail part, yeah. Sorry, Raz. I'm throwing you underneath <laughs> the bus. <laughs> Your steel game's weak. Still love you, though. So you got him covered in the steel still. I don't know. I hope so. Ooh, that's a that's a we could do a bomb hole uh, game of skate between you and Chris Rasman on the rails. <laughs> I would I would tune in. I'm tuning in. <laughs> I, I would I'm subscribe. producing this. I'm yes. subscribing. Oh well, right, well, let's fucking do it. All right, we switch switch it. We're gonna change venues here. We're going to X Games slope style. Okay, you take the same crew. Now you can include uh, Jody and Craig. Um, who's winning? Belzo again. That dude's right in the park. Every day he can, lacing back tens, front tens, back rodeo, seven noses, cab nines, like it's nothing. Belzo's like one of the, like, the top Whist Park riders sometimes. Like he rides through that place and fucking owns it. Okay, who's getting dead fucking last in this thing? <laughs> Let's be honest. We Let's all, be honest. Hey, Let's be honest. Say the right answer. Trust free. <laughs> Sorry, <You're> Jody. <laughs> <laughs> Those switchback threes won't cut it off the knuckle. <laughs> <laughs> DFL Jody Wachniak. Uh, <laughs> I feel like Jody depends catches. on who's judging though. Back when he did like dope ass melon poke or something like that could score high. Maybe not on fist criteria, but sometimes I feel bad for Jody. Sometimes I feel like he gets the shit end on the on the of the stick on the show. I remember in Rasmus' podcast, he got a couple fucking dingers too. Was he? Yeah. Well, he also gets he gets lifted up. Who, who do we have? Uh, MFR said that he, best style ever, Jody Wachniak. Oh, I would Max. agree. Jody's yep. style is fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. Like that dude has flavor, mm -hmm. and he like he like really cares about that aspect of his snowboarding. Like he wants to have his flavor and his style, and that means so much to him. And I like love and respect that about Jody. He doesn't care what he's doing, but he just wants to do it in the best, easiest way possible, which I think is amazing. I, I actually want to back this up for a second here. Did you also include Rusty in this competition? Where would he stack up? Is he on the podium? With a healthy slope back. Let's say, With a healthy let's back. Let's say slope style, healthy back. Oh, that's tough because I never really got to see Rusty ride the park. Yeah, like even even in like yeah, he was never I wasn't really around when Rusty was like riding the mountain. Like I never I don't think I've done one I've done I don't think I've ever seen Rusty hit a park jump now that I think about it. Mm. But I bet you Rusty would Rusty would be second next to Matt. Maybe Rusty could pull it. <laughs> I've, <Let's> talk <laughs> I've never seen him ride the park, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he does it, I respect that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I know Rusty's just the... Give him a second. Give him a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's definitely beating fucking Raz and Jody. Rusty's got some tricks you're, in the bag. But you probably got him covered. You're a man boy now. 
Oh, I know, but I'm not putting myself in that context. You got I you. can't put myself. I mean, where Matt's are you stacking up? Are you taking down Belzil if you put yourself in the hat? No. Belzil's so? just so consistent. He's the only one that's like, hey, it's December 14th. Um, it's sheer ice, a little bit of left to right wind. And Belzil's like, I'm thinking back 10. <laughs> what? Dude, you're 42 yeah. years old. <laughs> Sorry, did you stutter? <laughs> yeah, he is, uh, he is wild. His old, it, go watch Video Grass. I think it's Enlighten. He has some incredible rail tricks in that movie. And that's not a super old movie. You know, like it's pretty, like, I, I think he's so underrated. Great answer, Sean. I know I'm still beating this dead horse here, though. Solars, he's a man boy. Technically, does he, he's not on the podium, or is he? Where where are we at with Solars? Solars isn't on the slope south podium. He wins I, the high jump. <laughs> 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 but I was kind of keeping Solars a little bit out of there. I did consider him best best rail part Solars a couple of years ago. I think he had it, but I think Belzil is just consistently. Okay. Locked All in right. on the rails. We got to the bottom of that. I'm sorry for beating that dead horse, beating the absolute brakes off of that. Oh, <laughs> Mikey Cicerelli, is, he's not a man boy, technically. He's just on the outskirts as well. Okay, anyway, we'll keep moving. We got a guest question from Mikey Cicerelli. Here we go. Sean, buddy, on the bomb hole. Look at that. So stoked for you. I'm so proud of you and everything you've done in your career, and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. We've known each other for a long time got to live together, got to do all sorts of things. Don't really have a question for you, more of a, uh, just a, a note, I guess. Um, we work out together a lot and it's a really fun atmosphere, a lot of community there. We got Jody, we got Craig, we got Solars, always working out together, but you seem to always wear your headphones. And I'm just trying to tell you, maybe take the headphones off. We like to chat, you know? It's not all about getting too strong. We're just trying to get a little strong and have a little fun. I hope you uh, are having the best time on the bomb hole with Chris and Craig. Love you, buddy. Proud of you. Uh, see you soon. Oh, thanks, Mike. I, I love you. Dude, honestly, man, if I didn't, if I took off my headphones, I'd be there for like three and a half hours. And I got, I've been liking it, dude. I put on my headphones. I got a little motivational speech in there. And I'm like, I'm, it's like, it's whoa, fun. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're listening to motivational speaking while working out? No, like you put on like a little David Goggins oh. screaming at you. Like you're you're want to push some weight around. Okay, and let's so, also preface not head like your over ear sound canceling. There could be a rave you'd have no idea, which makes it great if people are cracking jokes <laughs> at you while you're working out too. <laughs> yeah, but I, dude, I maybe I could, but I feel like I would just lock into banter and just sit on the floor. Where like this where I kind of get in the zone a little bit. It's it's nice. And uh, also, I've been, like, trying to put on some weight and get strong, you know? Fucking Darcy's out here looking jacked. I can't be looking skinny when I'm around him. Yeah, for our, for our listeners only, if, if Sean lifted up his shirt right now, there would just be a stepbrother's quality ab right there. Adam Scott hasn't had a carb since uh, 2006. Yep. <laughs> oiled up. Also oiled up. <laughs> Keels. <laughs> A little bit of a our bonita fish big type of situation <laughs> on our hands, and they oh are what's God. called a trophy fish. So um, <laughs> going back, I I'm still want to get to the bottom of this. You're listening to David Goggins while working out. Well, I kind of bounce back and forth, but every now and then, yeah, I throw in a little David Goggins, fire me up, stay mm -hmm. fucking hard. Yep. I don't know. There's just there's something about like it's kind of fun to be in there and like try to push it, and like you got someone yelling, you're like ah. How many so, times a session do you put on Lose Yourself by Eminem? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever put that so, on. You could be honest. A little That's bit okay. of mom's spaghetti yeah. situation. <laughs> so I, also, uh, how many times are you intimidated when you look over and you see Russell 69 in Air Monarchs and a white beater? <laughs> Dude, Russell is the best fucking person in the gym. He's actually, dude, Russell's getting jacked. What's he running? What's his kit? Dude, he's fucking running a wife beater. He's fucking showing off his muscles. Um, Air Monarchs? I don't know what Air Monarchs the, are. Those Nike, like, dad shoes that he wears? Oh, yeah, he runs those into okay. the gym. Oh, yeah. Yep. Just a Oh, yeah. Jean shorts. Yep. Jean shorts, shorts? yeah. Okay. That's actually a Russell 69 staple. Jean shorts <laughs> and a wife beater. <laughs> 
steal but, his look. Yeah. But dude, that dude is the best person ever in the gym or anywhere. He is a grade A shit talker. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty funny. If you ever bum into wrestle, he's got all the inside scoop on the snowboard industry, and it's pretty funny when he goes on a tangent. Mm-hmm. Is he are, is he in creatine after the workout? Where are we at with creatine? Uh, I, I personally don't do any of that in, stuff. In HGH? No, but Ru- uh, I know Russell hits the creatine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's hitting the creatine hard. I'm on a little bit of like bone broth, but I don't really do any of that mm. other stuff. I'm like, keep it pretty au natural. They don't test for any of this though, for the record, when you're filming for man boys or anything, it's not, <laughs> No, you're kind of good to go. open runway. Yeah. 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 You're free burn, but I don't know. I just like feel like I don't like that shit and- I don't know. Maybe I should hit the creatine. See what happens. Zach Hale just punching his steering wheel right now. <laughs> <laughs> Take the creatine. Zach's whatever Zach's doing is working. Uh, all right, that's good. I like the gym scene. That's fun. It's fun for the whole family. I'm looking over at the kid here. He's rocking a crispy Arteryx crew neck. Um, new sponsor. Yep. So recently, well, two years ago now, Arteryx started a snowboard program with uh, me, Spencer, Victor, Jared, Robin, Elena, and Sevi. And it's been like, it's been one of the most amazing experiences and one of the best brands to ever work for. They like, they're so amazing. They truly care about us as people first and rather second, as well as they give us like so many amazing opportunities from like working with the design team and starting to learn that side of the whole industry, as well as like We have a full-time sports psychologist that works with us and physio. And the big thing is like the sports psychologist. I don't think many brands, let alone an outerwear company, has a sports psychologist for the athletes to work with. And it's been like one of like a new thing that I've been working on with him. And it's been one of the biggest helps and like life upgrades in my life. It like has changed me as a person since I've started working closer with him and yeah, I just like feel so grateful to be able to have access to a sports psych through my outerwear sponsor. It's like truly the best. That's insane. So with this sports psychologist, you, you're doing a phone call and then it, what is it like an hour session and you're just checking in? What are you working on with this person? So um, his name's actually John Coleman. He's He's the man. But so we do phone calls, like hour phone calls. Like I, he's like, whenever I need him, I could text him and he like, will call me right away. Like there was so many times throughout the winter where I was like struggling to get over something or like work through something. And he was there for me tenfold. But one thing that I've added into my daily routine is like I do 10 minutes of journaling in the moment, in the morning, as well as some meditation and visualization work. And it's like anyone, all my close friends has seen it. Like since before I started working with him to like now, it's like, it's just changed my whole outlook on life. I feel like I'm able to, handle situations better and just like be like be more me and like just work through things it's been like really opened my mind and allowed me to like step back and have a clear vision on everything it's like I can't stress it enough if as like we're snowboarders but we do like a sport that involves a lot of mental work and it's like working with the sports psych kind of sounds like maybe a little bit corny but like it's amazing. It helps so much. Just even having someone to talk to and bounce ideas off is like, it's the best. Um, I know that this year you you have a lot of pressure because, you know, like the first couple of years you're filming, you're getting invited on to the crew and, and you're learning and you did a fantastic job on this. This year you're kind of leading a little bit of a video um, and you got a lot of sponsors behind you and the snow is not very good. Um, tons of pressure on you this year. Did you feel that pressure and and how did you use those tools that you were talking about to overcome that? Yeah. So like, I'm not going to lie, like this year at the start was, it was kind of crazy because I feel like the past few years I was like kind of along for this like ride and everything was just, it was happening. It was like working out. I, And then it was like one thing after another, like things started to like snowball. And then this year being able to kind of take more charge of a project and like, man, but we're not doing a man boys film this year. It's going to be a little bit different. I felt like a little overwhelmed and like kind of like I was like, whoa, like I'm I'm here. Like I I I I want I don't have I won't don't want to say pressure, but like I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform. I'm like, you have all these amazing opportunities, you have so many people supporting you. 
like I want to perform for them and for myself. And it was a struggle. And one of the things we worked on was just like meditating, like building that self confidence. Like when I felt something, I would like journal it and write it down and check on it. And like that just allowed me to kind of like take a step back and like clear my brain a little bit. And like without that, I think it would have been a really, really hard winter. And I don't know how I would have made it through it because it was like, it's not like I have pressure, but it was just like throughout the past couple of years, it kind of felt like a snowball effect. And like, I was just like a kid in a candy store, like, ah, and then like, started this winter, I was like, whoa, like I'm here. I get to like live my dream life, like the life 10 year old Sean always wanted to live. It was my dream. I don't have to work a normal job. I feel very lucky that I get the snowboard. And then it was, yeah, it was a little bit overwhelming at the time. And I did put a lot of pressure on myself, but throughout the process of working with the sports psych, I learned to just like fall back and be present in the moment. Cause like, if you're thinking about a million other things, you can't snowboard. True. And as you, as you climb up the ranks, so to speak, in snowboarding, there are more opportunities, there are more obligations, there are more things. And you do essentially snowboard less, the more quote unquote pro you become. I think it's interesting thinking about that. That was a great question, Craig, because it's like you're, you're fighting for a seat at the table, so to speak. You're trying to make it, you're trying to prove yourself as a snowboarder that you can, you know, you're, you're worth it to these brands and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden the brands are kind of like, here's your seat at the table. Here's some support. We're behind you. And all of a sudden you're kind of the guy and there is a, a different level of expectations and different level of pressure, mainly probably put on by yourself. But yeah, it's, it's a interesting thing to talk about going from trying to make it to kind of not saying that there's like a top of the mountain, but the pressure with bigger contracts and bigger sponsors comes more expectation. Yeah. And I think it was just like, before I was just like, feeling so like Lally doll. I was just like, like by no means made it or anything or done anything like that. But like, I think it was more or less like, I was just like, I was like fall, kind of following along and being like, whoa, this is so exciting. And then like, definitely like this year I was kind of like, okay, like keep, keep moving forward. Like you got this. And I kind of, I put a lot, like I hung out a lot with you, Greg. I put a lot of pressure on myself. I was like, I want to film the best shit I can this year and really show up. But then by like wanting that, I also put so much pressure on myself. That was unneeded. Yeah. And like it just, it really taught me to be present in the moment and not yeah. think about that. For some of the listeners and viewers, um, what are some actionable advice, some things you talked about journaling? How do you journal? What do you journal when you meditate? What are your steps? Um, so like one of the things I've learned with journaling is like, I, there's no point. Like, it's not like journal, but it's like, I take 10 minutes and I write whatever's in my mind and just don't stop writing and just like free write. Some of it makes sense. Some of it's like, I'm tired. I want coffee. I like pizza. And some of it's like, I woke up this morning. I'm feeling like this. I didn't, I wish I was acting this way or pushing myself in this way. Or some of it's like, I'm so stoked right now. This went well, this went well, this went well. And like, it's just nice because when you write it down, you're able to kind of like think about it on the back end and be like kind of like analyze it and like take a step back and see it from the back end. And it's also nice just to like let shit air out. And then as well as like with meditating, one thing I was working on is like visualization. So we were like running through like a little like guided meditation with John. And it was like visualizing snowboarding, visualizing what you wanted to do. And I was adding it into like my pre, like sometimes when I was at the top of the jump, it was like a pre-routine where I would like go back into this like, breath work state and like this visualization state and it was helping quite a bit explain exactly what you're doing you're at the top of the jump you're breathing and you're thinking about doing the trick well yeah so <laughs> i'm just it's gonna sound really funny but like one of the things was we like picked like a very symbolic thing and one of it was we did this guided meditation and it was like what it was like what animal do you visualize was one of the questions and it was an eagle and then i started to do this thing where like before i drop he was like, take a second and take four deep breaths and hold your arms out and visualize yourself as an eagle flying through the mountains. And that would just like take my mind out of anything I was thinking. And all I could think about was being an eagle. And then when I stopped, I was like in the present moment and there attentive. I wasn't thinking about what I needed to do that night or what was going on tomorrow, what was happening in this life or and then you, you know what I mean? back 10 and stop. No. no, by no means. But it's like, it was kind of like cool because it was like yeah. a, a learning lesson. Like a, it was something I never thought I would have done. But now I've, 
as I'm doing it, I've learned I love it. And it's been an integral part of my routine. And I like wish I would have done it years ago and really like taken that action. Dude, I love, I am fascinated. Thank you for sharing that with hearing people's processes of what gets them there. And, you know, it's so interesting. Everybody's got different stuff like Bjorn, Linus. He, every time he drops in for a line, he sings Let the Good Times Roll as he's dropping in. And he's singing the, the song as he, and he also does some like chanting stuff sometimes. But all those things, whatever works to get you there uh, is fantastic. So thanks for sharing that. No worries. I, I, think it, I think it's cool. Everyone is like so different too. Some people like, they don't need that. They're able to lock in and like, it's just like something that like I'm doing to try, like I want to have any sort of benefit. If it like is going to benefit me and help me ride to the best of my abilities, it's like, I want to take every option I can mm -hmm. from like going to the gym to working with a sports psychologist. It's just like, if it could be 1% better, why not? Cause that 1% better is going to snowball into 365% mm -hmm. better at the end of the year. If you get 1% better every day. Quick math. Nice. Yeah. That's, that was phenomenal math right there. <laughs> that's good stuff. So listening to you talk today, I've heard a lot of like insane stories from being in the mountains, from rescuing people to yourself being rescued, to calming yourself down, doing big tricks, to being stuck in bowls, to just a lot of life lessons in the mountains. Do you have any uh, notable life lessons from the mountains? Totally. I think being in the mountains, they're like very humbling. Like it's mother nature. It's like no matter how prepared you are, shit can go wrong. And it's not about when shit, like if shit can go wrong, it's when it does. It's like how you handle it. It's like being in the moment, being prepared, doing everything you can. So you're prepared in that moment. And that's like one of the biggest life lessons is like do everything you can on the back end to make the front end as easy as it can. And like the mountains are gnarly. They're humbling. They're crazy. They're wild. It's like do everything you can to prepare so when shit hits the fan, you're ready. And that in all aspects of life, do everything you can to prepare. So if something happens in your life, you're ready for it. It's like, don't just go in all like green and naive because shit happens. Damn. I also think I like hearing you talk about the blend of your guys' crew, how you have like Jody out there making you laugh. Like whoever, you know, Raz is dialed. Yeah. We have like, we have the best blend of crew as well. It's like, we kind of have all walks of life. We got Razman who's like, He's like the guy who can calm you down and build your confidence up if you're like scared and talk you through things. He's like the best person to have if you're filming. Then you got Jody the jokester where it's like, dude, sometimes I can't even film with Jody when he's hitting a jump because I just laugh at him. He's <laughs> absolutely insane. And then we got Belzil who's like giving me life advice and like trying to like talk to me about like outside of snowboarding life advice. And then we got Rusty who just likes to take the piss out of me and it's like a perfect balance and an equilibrium. I feel like so lucky every day that I was able to link up with those dudes. It's like they've, they've become like more than friends. They're like family. It's, it's amazing. It shows you guys are a good group. Are you going to film a front five this year, you think? <laughs> uh, I hope so. I mean, Craig knows I don't like front fives. Don't like them. No, at all costs, I do everything <laughs> to not do a front five. But uh, I hope so because I like I feel like that's a, a hole in my snowboarding, and I don't want to be like a snowboarder that like can't do a trick. So I I hope I do a front five. I was doing a few in the springtime, really trying to figure it out. I was doing a lot of front rodeo fives. I would love to do a front rodeo five. Bring back the toe pop. Yeah, toe pop's fun. Keep things fresh. I feel like I was filming a lot with Stale. This winter, and he is a front rodeo technician. Yeah. And he was like, it was so sick. He was giving me so many tips and little pointers. And it just like looks like a really nice trick to do in the backcountry. Like you take off nice and flat base and straight, you get good pop. So I, I hope so one day. I but goddamn, I hate front fives. <laughs> front ten double, not a problem. Front five, huge <laughs> problem. I hate him. I hate him. Huge problem. Did you ride half pipe growing up? Uh, no, I like definitely would cruise through the pipe, but I wasn't like ripping the pipe. White like, City didn't really have one, did it? <laughs> <laughs> More of a drop and ramp into yellow <laughs> flat bar situation. Okay, let's get into hot takes. What do you think about that? I'm down. Let's do some hot takes. All right, goat of snowboarding, both male and female, who you got? Nicholas Mueller, Jamie Anderson. <laughs> would you consider snowboarding an art form, a sport, or a lifestyle? I would say an art form and a lifestyle because it's not just 
it's not a, a sport because everyone does it differently with a different approach. And it's like, we're really just expressing ourselves out there. And it's like, yeah, we do sport like things, but like, we're really, I'm just out there just trying to express myself and do what I think is cool, which I don't think most sports do that. And it's like a lifestyle. I got into snowboarding because I think the snowboard lifestyle is the fucking shit. Like it's so fun and it's like a cool thing and a cool community. Like I say it's both art form and lifestyle. Who's the most, one of the most underrated riders in your opinion? Jaden Chomlak for sure. <laughs> Steel or powder? Tough one. Powder. <laughs> that, was, that was silk. <laughs> yeah. What, what was that silk? You didn't. Sorry. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> silk doesn't agree with that pick. Yeah. It's unfortunate when people get one wrong. So we'll keep it going here. <laughs> Favorite style ever? Nico. Uh, who's got your favorite method? Mickey Albin or Nico? Who's your favorite person to snowboard with? Ooh, that's a tough one. I would say Rasmin or Cicerelli. It's like, it's tough. They're like, both of them are like family to me. I love riding with Mikey because we push each other and we're so tight. But also like there's some, me and Rasmin just have like a connection that's like so deep and he helps me out so much in so many ways and I push him in my own way. So it's, it's tough. Who's got the worst method out of your friends? <laughs> oh. Well, I got to put someone on blast here. I think Jody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jody's got like a sick melon, but I don't think I've yeah. ever seen him kick out a method. It, it, he, he does have an incredible melon, and I think that, that comes at the detriment of his method. You know? yeah. Yeah. And also, it was just funny to call out Jody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might be a podcaster thing. I kind of share that same... Uh, Bad method trait with them. Okay, so keeping it moving, we got a favorite snowboard video ever made. That's a tough one. I would say, oh, there's so many. I would say Absent 12, just because there's the Nico part where he does the back three to back three, but Powder Hounds Volume 2, just because I watched that video on repeat seven million fucking times to the point where Mikey was getting mad at me because I would watch it five times in a row. And it's just like, at that point in time in my snowboarding, like the whole mount, like backcountry snowboard lifestyle, driving around with trucks and sleds, being in cabins, riding pow. That film just encapsulates the vibe so well. And I don't know, something special about it. Go watch Powder Hounds Volume 2 if you haven't. What's your favorite snowboard graphic ever made? <sighs> That's a, Well, no, I think it's the Nitro Mountain with the sunflowers on it. That was the first Nitro board I rode, and I just... I don't know, something about it. it was so simple and clean. I loved it. Did Griff do that graphic? Griff did do that graphic. Wow, he, he's going to cream his jeans when he hears that. <laughs> I think I've told him that before. <laughs> it's it's a funny one, but I don't know. That one, like, I had a very special year on that snowboard, and I love that graphic. And Okay. Uh, also not picky on graphics, so. Okay. Uh, dream? Oh, no. If you go heliboarding three people, who's going in the chopper? Just good times. You're not filming. You're just time of your life. You can bring celebrities as well, I will say. <sighs> Young Dolly brought Mike Tyson. <laughs> oh, celebrities. They're uh, still up there, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Did Mike bring his tiger? <laughs> <laughs> I can't I think he I can't remember who else he had. And just uh two models, he said. Yeah, I think is that what it was? Yeah, I think so. Nice yeah. Good memory. Thank He's you. sharp. He's sharp. Um <laughs> I think I'll go just the snowboarder route, just like three people that I would love to snowboard with. I would love to snowboard with Nico just to like see in person how he rides the mountain and be able to like pick his brain on certain things. Um and then Mikkel because he's just fucking hilarious and tons of fun. And then Rasmin, he's my dog. Like, just like any time I get to snowboard with him, he's the man. It's a great crew. It's a great crew. Dream sponsor, any sponsor in the world does not have to be snowboard related. I mean, I have like a bunch of my dream sponsors, but fuck, I would love to be on Ski Do. That's the right answer. Wow. Nice. Get, yeah, that's great. Get, get the sled, get the Sea Do, yep. get the live it, it is, up. Yep. I was it actually nice. lucky, nice. lucky enough that Craig lent me a Sea Do the other week to go on the house sound on Ocean Day and I am I sold. Those things are pretty damn fun. Okay. Uh, first try, backcountry, pat down, step down. What trick are you doing? Uh, I, mean, land. I mean, I'm probably a front three. That's kind of my go-to in classic. If I said anything else, I would be fucking lying. Greg? I think that's the right answer. If, if you three. did say any for, for you, me, yeah. oh, 
damn, I don't know. Lately, Switchback Uno has been Switchback Uno has been a kind of a go. Or you know what I've been loving is the uh, Toto Five. Whew. Yeah, you got a good. Yeah, I like. Bro. I've been liking that on uh, step downs. I want to do more of that. Um, but I, I would agree with you, Sean. If you would have said anything other than a front three, just because you've got a cover, an ender, and two openers. Better front threes. <laughs> so if it's not that answer, I don't know what it is. Yeah. But you know what's a weird one though? To me, it's like you got like you could back three, but then it's like if you're gonna do a back three, you might as well do a cab five. So like I feel like a cab five is like is the same as a front three. Almost easier to land. I, I don't know I if that sh- sounds weird. I struggle with cab fives. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I struggle. I, I do them, but like I wouldn't do it first hit off of a big step down. I just struggle with like over rotating on that one. Overcooking the turkey, if you yeah. will. I'm more of a switchback fiber. Whew. Switchback five Tuckney or Japan or whatever. Those ones are sick. I try I've been trying to work on it. Like I really I really like the C where you do like the switchback. It's like 180 and then you tuck it in, you pull it out. Like there's like a certain sequence in the rotation if you do it properly and you film it from the back end. It looks so sick. Okay, last question. Worst trend. What do you got? Cool guys and snowboarding people that just like were too cool for school. I think it's fucking whack. I think snowboarding's already a small enough culture and community. And we need to make sure everyone feels included and like feels heard because if not, like what the fuck are we doing? Like support, like talk to everyone on the mountain, like make them feel included. That's only going to grow snowboarding, which is the best thing for it. Like I don't want snowboarding to feel like this. Ex- it's already so hard to get into and if we make it this exclusive club i just i don't think it's helping it fantastic answer um okay let's talk uh let's talk setups real quick uh walk us through what board you're riding what plank so i'm riding the nitro alternator um i ride a 160 in the back country how tall are you 510 maybe it's definitely like on the bigger side. I think like a bigger board with, makes things way easier in the backcountry. Um, and then I ride the Nitro Team bi- Team Pro Bindings or the Nitro Phantoms. I kind of run back and forth. And then outerwear, I run full head to toe Arky. It's the shit. I'm always warm and dry. Gyro goggles, top shelf, air hole. All right, so we're talking about setups here as well. Uh, bindings, forward lean, where are we? Uh, one notch. Like, it's just notches on the nitro binding cycle, like one notch, but not too much. I, like, have messed around with it a little bit, but I've just, the one notch works, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. How are those nitro uh, bear traps? They're they're fantastic. I I love them. Like, this, this set of bindings, the Phantoms, they're, like, they're the best. They're so comfy. They like the high backs a little softer and it's just like creates a nice playfulness with the stiff board. I'm, I'm really digging it. I just, just started riding those at the end of the year. They're my new favorite binding. So you go angle grinder to the edge, right out of the box, get that thing dull. <laughs> Dude, I used to, and I, when I was younger, I would fucking hit the angle grinder, but now I just straight out of the plastic. And I normally just run like one setup all year, just same whip. How many boots do you go through a year? I went through one pair last year, but uh, yeah, I just ran one pair of boots. It was my first year doing that. Normally I do two, but I'm not like that picky about boots. We'll say that board does look pretty fun. It looks floaty, but you can slant switch type of deal. Oh, it's like the dream board. Griff absolutely killed it so hard. What's next for Sean Miskman? Uh, what's next? Um, next year we're going to be filming a project, me, Stale. Darcy Sharp, Rasmin, um, hopefully Targaryen, and do that as well as I'm really hoping one day to be a natural selection. I think that would be a dream to be able to ride. It's some of the best snowboarders in the world in that contest, and I would love to be amongst those people and be able to ride with them. But one thing I do, I don't want to be there until I'm ready, and like I want to take make sure when I'm there, I'm there ready to perform and like really just gain my experience. There's no rush. I'm pretty, I'm young, but one day I want to be at natural selection and be able to ride with some of the world's best and just do that. Nice. And where can, um, wonderful listeners and viewers watch your footage of this fall? Um, that is to be determined. Maybe bombhole.com. 
like I love that. Yeah, let's run it up. <laughs> That's great. It's news to me, yeah. but I'm, I'm. We'll get it on. Let's get it on there. Yeah, yeah. We're working out some of the details right now. We're uh, working on it with our, our editor Thomas Doyle, and it's been a really, really fun journey. It's my first time kind of being able to sit in the editing bay and have some more hands-on experience, and it's been great. All right, Sean. Lastly, would you like to throw any thank yous out? I'd love to throw some thank yous out. First off, I need to thank my mom, my dad, and my sister. They have been my biggest supporters since day one. I don't know what I would do without both my parents and especially my sister. They have had my back since day one and has always anything I've ever needed and has always trusted my vision, and I'm forever grateful for that. As well as I would like to thank the whole team at Arterix, Justin Sweeney, DK, Claire, they're so amazing. Everyone at Monster, Hodges, and Carly, they're the best. Um, Airhole, Max Janky, Gyro, Emily, Nitro Canute, and Ryan. I'm so grateful to have those guys having my back, as well as I would like to thank all the man boys, Russell Davies, Matt Carey, all my homies back in Whistler. I love you all, and if I missed anyone. Unlimited? Un- unlimited. <laughs> Unlimited Snow and Skate as well. Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for everyone's support, and I love everyone. And if I missed you, you know I'm grateful for you. That was beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show, Sean. That was a great podcast. Uh, fucking awesome. I had a great time. Did you have a good time? I had an amazing time. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sil, Craig, Chris. It was truly an honor to be here. I, there's been so many people and so many legends I've looked up to my whole life to sit in this seat. It feels pretty surreal being here. Cool. I love it. Well, let, why don't we let the true broadcasting professional Craig oh, McMorris do our God, sign off here? Oh God, we laughed, we cried, we hugged. There was tears. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. We thank you, Sean. We thank you, Chris. We thank you, Silk. We thank the entire bomb hole team. We thank our listeners, our viewers, our Patreon members. We thank Canada. We thank America. We thank NATO. We thank you all so much for tuning in to a fantastic episode of the bomb hole. We will be back next week with another heater. <laughs> Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, boys. We did it. That was a motivational speech. You can put, <laughs> dude, you can play. Do it. <laughs>